All right, folks, it is 6.01, so we will uh, reconvene at this time. Um, Madam Acting Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. Okay, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? All right, then, seeing none, we will uh, we'll resume where we left off uh, last evening. Uh, so we have three three more departmental presentations to move through, and then we will move into budget deliberations from there. So at this point, uh, we will move to business, environment, and projects. So I'll invite uh, Commissioner Hugenboss uh, to take the floor, and we will go from there. Thanks, Beth, that's great. Okay, hi there. Uh, my name is Peter Hugenboss. I'm the Commissioner for Business, Environment, and Projects. Very pleased here to, uh, to present at the third of uh, 14 nights of budget. So thank you for having me. Um, no, this, is, this is it, it's gonna be great. Um, I, I typically really like the opportunity to, to present a budget for, for my teams, um, really get to, um, promote and celebrate all the great work they're doing. I am going to try to be uh, more brief uh, this evening than I have been maybe in previous years. Um, I know you've learned a lot about our groups and, and will continue to do so, but uh, it, is, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I may not be able to get to all the different staff and what they're doing tonight, so I just want to say to, to staff who might be watching, uh, we do value everything you do every day uh, in the front lines and uh, right to our, our senior managers and directors of the groups. Um, but in the interest of time, we'll make sure we get through this uh, in, in, in short order. So the, the business environment projects portfolio is coming in at a 7.77% a uh, increase, but uh, that includes the 0.16% uh, green standard CIP special levy that uh, the treasurer did speak about and I will we'll speak a little bit more about that in the presentation um, but net of that levy it is a 4.6 percent increase now the uh, these groups uh, these departments are typically of a of a lower total budget than some of the bigger departments like public works and in housing and social services but uh, but rec is a, is a sizable chunk um, some of the um, Great work that is done in this team is also shared across all those different departments as well. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. The business environment and projects um, uh, capital budget is a, is a relatively small ask this year. Again, you heard from the treasurer of, of keeping the lights on and doors open, and we recognize there's a lot of works in progress. So this is a, a relatively modest capital budget ask um, for, for 2023. We start off with the business, real estate, and environment department. Uh, the director is Brandon Forrest, and he is here uh, tonight. And the uh, the variance here is uh, is just over eight percent. This is uh, mostly due to salaries and wages of, of staff in this uh, this department. Um, we have reallocated. I think Commissioner Joyce talked about allocating more staff salaries to capital, where it makes more sense. In some of his project areas. In, in our case, we actually scaled back a little bit in, uh, in some roles in, in this department to reflect that there is more operating work going on than, than in the past uh, of more project-based. So that accounts for some of the, uh, the, the additional uh, budget requests for this year, as well as a position that started half in, in 2022 in the Environment Division is now full-time going into 2023, helping the whole corporation handle uh, environmental uh, soils. Key highlights, um, we talked about it last week at councils, acquiring and servicing new land for the, the high pressure demand in the employment land sector. Uh, we are continuing to work with Queen's University in that regard as well. Um, we, uh, uh, not only land, but we also need to work with our partners to, to focus on the rural economic development strategy as well as the, the whole integrated development strategy with, with our partners at KEDCO. So that is a, a, a large and important role that Brandon and his team have. We, uh, we do all the real estate work for the corporation, buying lands, selling, leasing. Um, 
one of the um, that's, that's a, it's one of the great parts of this department is the work it gets to do across the whole corporation from a, from a service perspective. Um, and most recently, there's been a lot of work and significantly good work working with our partners in housing on the potential for acquiring or repurposing lands for, for housing initiatives. And you'll be seeing a, a report next week about an accelerator program to, to use city property. And Brandon and his team are, uh, are co-leaders to, to push that through. The uh, environment division as part of this group is focused on um, beneficial soil reuse and, and saving money and repurposing sites for, for soil in, in accordance with provincial regulations and um, of course our community uh, improvement plan for brownfields. The um, capital ask, like I said, is modest for, for 2023. There's a lot of works in progress in this area with the significant work we're doing with employment land servicing with the with life cycle and, and other other properties um, we do have to continue to monitor groundwater at certain city properties in line with regulations of the province as well as uh, certificates of approval ecas that we have and we are working on our temporary excess soil facility up at creekford so uh and in in 2023 there's just some real estate related uh, capital asks the climate leadership division is uh, a very small division in people um, and a very big influence across the community. We have um, a very large variance, as you see, 112% uh, because that includes that 0.16%, but net of that, it actually is going down slightly. We've just transitioned on, uh, on different things in the, in the staffing related. Uh, it is not a reflection of uh, scaling back the work, it's only ramping up. In, in this division. The, the Green Standard Community Improvement Plan it has, was approved by Council in 2021 knowing that it needed to be funded and it needed to be funded starting in 2023. It's off the ground, it's underway, and we had money to do that in 2022, but this budget reflects the start of a four-year program to fund that. And this is to incentivize the new construction of buildings uh, to a much higher degree of energy efficiency than the building code uh, requires. And we have interest already. We expect to have three applications here in 2023. Very excited about that. Um, and this funding is necessary in order to, to cover some of those costs that are incremental to a typical building construction. You'll also be seeing a uh, report to council uh, likely by the end of March on some changes we want to make to the program, even though it hasn't started, because this technology in this sector does uh, change. It doesn't change the budget, it just makes things easier for the applicants and for us to administer the program. Um, some other key highlights for the Climate Leadership Division, um, continuing to, uh, to implement the Better Homes Kingston program to retrofit homes across the, across the city. You've heard a lot about that from me already. Um, we are partnering with Spiros Canales and, and his great group at Facilities Management and Construction on investigating ground mount solar on city properties and we'll be bringing information back to council on that. We have an ongoing requirement to implement all the, the great initiatives in the climate leadership plan um, that, uh, that are there, as well as working with our, um, uh, our, our neighborhood climate action champions that we've talked recently at council about as well and continuing that that great program at the grassroots ground level the um, we're so happy with the um, uh, sorry the climate action fund that does great work for for nonprofits here um, and sustainable Kingston is a big partner in, in a lot of the work that the climate leadership division does so we uh, we're excited about the year ahead and working with council on priorities. I expect there might be some priorities coming out of council for climate leadership, which is fantastic. From a capital perspective, works in progress is very large because the Better Homes Kingston is, is a great program, uh, but a modest ask to continue the, the work that we are doing in the 2023 capital for, uh, um, for the group. Arts and culture services. Uh, this is led by uh, Colin Wigginton, who's also here tonight. And what, uh, it's a very small variance in, uh, in budget request. It is, like I said earlier, um, uh, continuing to operate in 2023, all services and programs. Um, but despite the modest increase, we are introducing a few new programs uh, out in the community because 
the pandemic is, is behind us from that perspective and has really held us back from, from doing a few things out there. Um, we do have lasting impacts though of COVID-19 and that's it's very typical for the entertainment industry across, across globally, but definitely in Ontario and Canada. So we're working to support uh, there. We have um, uh, ambitions to work with our partners in, in recreation and in EDI to expand our reach out into the community to offer some arts programming. We want to pilot some things. We want to see and get into different areas of the city, including the rural areas and east and west and central. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we are continuing to, uh, to implement public art, and this group has done some great things, more of a permanent nature. 2023 may be more focused on a temporary nature or smaller scale, um, such as public art on the Wabin Crossing, once the weather gets nicer and we can, we can do some things there. So we're, we're very excited about that. It's also a program to pilot uh, crosswalks, where we can paint, probably all familiar with the Pride crosswalk right out in front of City Hall here, but there's other initiatives we can do in other crosswalks across the city, so we want to pilot a program uh, such as at Rideau Heights Community Centre crosswalk there, engage the community, and engage the professional artists, and, uh, and make something cool happen there that we could maybe roll out on a larger scale uh, in future years. We have the Creative Industry Strategy, which we're going to talk a lot about next, uh, next week at Council, um, which is film, music, and theatre, and the economic impact it has, and it's significant here in Kingston. Uh, the Kingston Music Strategy is being driven right now uh, through this department in partnership with many partners, uh, including Tourism Kingston. Um, we also have lots of partners and uh, strategic alliances with groups that facilitate funding out into the into the community to make sure artists have uh, access to, to, to paid funds and to support the, uh, the community as far as, far as arts and theater. Um, from a capital perspective, then we have some works in progress here to support our facilities and the Grand Theater, our great partnership with the JK Tet Center, and, um, and work with um, uh, the, the Kingston Grand Theater, I think I mentioned. The um, very important for the for the capital request for 2023 is the funding that's needed to implement some uh, key strategies out of the uh, creative industries uh, work, which you'll hear more about next week. But uh, it's it's a good use of funds across many partners, such as Tours in Kingston and Keiko and others, to um, um, to one really uh, market our our great creative industries. Um, creative industry in Kingston and to uh, and integrate it with from a tourism perspective to residents to um, to, the, to the artists themselves. Moving into recreation and leisure services which is a, a five percent just over five percent increase for 2023. This department is led by the Krista Turner, who is also here tonight in between Brandon and Colin. Uh, the variance is uh, mostly related to the partnerships that we have to deliver programming, uh, specifically with, uh, with the Y and the Boys and Girls Club. Um, not to say that the Krista and her team don't deliver wonderful services and, and facilities across the city, um, but we also rely on partners to deliver great, great program, pro programming to, to kids, to seniors, to all the great uh, sport groups that we have. Uh, this group also operates the, the two marinas and um, uh, does, does great things. We, um, another great part of Recreation and Leisure is special event program, programming. So we'll continue to deliver programming uh, such as the great Canada Day events that we, that we launched last year at uh, three different events across the city, but also working with our partners in EDI and arts and culture and, and heritage services with Emancipation Day and Indigenous Peoples Day um, and, and several others that are really welcomed by the community and we partner with, uh, with local organizations to deliver. Uh, as you know, we will be bringing back an aquatics report to Council uh, in Q3 2023. Um, and we have a great partnership with the Y to operate um, facilities both at the Y and in our own facilities with a FitPass program that makes the users uh, very accessible to, to any location. We are reviewing options now that we do own the water lot right out front here for Confederation Basin Marina. We recently uh, received that for a dollar from uh, the federal government. 
it now enables us to 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 look at options to 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 operate that facility potentially through a third party operator so that that feasibility work and will will happen in 2023 it will still be operated completely by 20 by city staff here in 2023 and there may be some options for council to consider uh, later in the in the year the uh, loving spoonful is getting started with operating the market so we'll be supporting them right out here and the um my apologies we we have recently hired a, a community development coordinator, coordinator position and this is this is great i know i've talked to some counselors about this having someone that work with neighborhood associations and people across the community on special events and use of, of city parks and city facilities and also partner with folks in arts and culture to deliver programming and such as the the crosswalk program and others so very excited about uh, about that position and our partnership with tennis clubs of canada and indoor pickleball and indoor tennis, but also seeing opportunities uh, connecting the the facility with volleyball groups and other sporting groups too, to really maximize that facility in in, in, the, in King City East, which is which is privately owned and operated, but the city has a vested interest. We are uh, buying time in order to facilitate public access. The capital budget for rec and leisure services is uh, um, there's a lot here because there's a lot of rec facilities, but there are, are a lot of asset management work that is partnered between rec and leisure and, fa and facilities in Spiros's group of 2.3 and another 2.4 uh, to continue the improvements. And one of the great projects that uh, is continuing to look into is the Memorial Center revitalization. And that is um, uh, you know, critical to keep that work advancing uh, to put ourselves in a position for potential grant funding for that redevelopment. There's also some needed work to to understand the dock infrastructure at both our marinas um, in order to keep them in good working order and potentially look at a third party operator. Finally, the major projects office is the team that most famous for delivering the uh, the Wabin Crossing on time and on budget, but that project actually still isn't completed. It's open, but uh, there's still wrap-up work in the first half of 2023, uh, and that will be uh, be completed by this group. This group is also, and I think you heard it last night, in Commissioner Joyce's uh, presentation about the Montreal Street and John Connor Boulevard intersection. So that's next on the list, and the, the team has already started to work on that project. So they'll be leading that project in connection with Commissioner Joyce's team in transportation and engineering. But these folks will take the lead on that, as well as other projects in the future. But priority for 2023 is the bridge and that intersection work for this team. This team has no operating net uh, increase or decrease because it's run com completely from capital funds because of the nature of their work. So that's where you see there's there's no budget request there. It's it's all approved at this time. The work's in progress of 59 million. And finally, the commissioner's office is mine with a variance of almost 9%. I would like to, to take just a moment to uh, say this office is, is myself and our um, uh, Executive um, uh, as, uh, Assistant Holly Saunders, who is um, is filling in for Liz Cartwright, who is working in the CAO's office right now. And what we've done with the commissioner's office is we support um, uh, Holly. Doesn't not only supports me, but also does the administrative support to Brandon's group and business real estate environment. Also the major projects office, as well as the climate leadership division. So it's a big role, um, Liz paved the way for this, and it's a really good model to be able to have someone connected to, to all of those groups. And uh, uh, Rita Coughlin supports um, uh, both the Krisha and Collins group. So we have really, I think, made an efficient use of resources on the administrative side, and are, they are doing a wonderful job to keep us in line and, and keep our, uh, um, our projects moving. And that's it, thank you. Ms. Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Councilor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, the, I, I, thank you for your presentation. I uh, appreciate that, Commissioner. It was very well uh, detailed and well done. The Better Homes Kingston program, I noticed that you have 1,100, or there's 1,100 homes that are now registered and sign up for the program. Is that now capped? 
Is there any more funding for the program? Yeah, thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the program is, is essentially at capacity right now. We have a lot of work to, to move through those, uh, those files, which will take uh, two or three years to get all that work done and have those, those retrofits completed. However, um, one of our, our key jobs this year is to find a way to uh, get more funding and, uh, for this program, whether it's through us, through a partner, through uh, grant opportunities. We know we have a lot of work ahead of us for, for doing this great work with 1,100 applications, but um, we, we wanna pursue the avenues to, to find more funding and bring that back to council. And we have, uh, we have a leg up on a, on a couple of strategies. Um, that, my, yes, my suggestion is I'm, I'm getting uh, the odd email from a constituents indicating they would like to sign up for that program, but they, it's capped. So it would, be, it would be great if we could expand that, but I understand capacity issues as well. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, we, would, we would love to be able to do every house tomorrow. Uh, that needs it, uh, but the capacity would be an issue. So we have to find funding for that capacity as well, uh, because we have partners with Sustainable Kingston and and, uh, and who merged with Red Squirrel to help us get out there and 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 facilitate the audits and the coaching that's required in order to facilitate these, uh, and all that's part of the funding that we have, which is fantastic. But to to increase the capacity of the program, we need people, we need money, and it's um, uh, that's what that's what we're working on right now for sure. Something for the 2024 budget, perhaps. We hope, yeah, we'll yes, we'll okay. work on that. Okay. Um, Portsmouth Olympic Harbor Dock Review. Um, in the dock review, does that include the power review and the, I can't think of the word, the mechanism that lifts the boats out? Uh, is that under review oh, as well? Thank you. I'm going to turn that question over, Councillor, to Director Turner. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson, uh, yes, Councillor Amos, it will, um, the dock feasibility study will be everything from the structure of the docks to, to the power component. It'll, it'll cover everything. It'll give us a good idea as to next steps. Ms. Turner knows where I was going with that, so I appreciate that answer. Uh, um, and it, and uh, I noticed that there is a, in the recreation, there is an 8% increase to user fees uh, specifically to uh, hockey, um, is it just hockey, or is it is it across the board? And I and I know that rinks cost a lot to maintain, and 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 I know that we have one very old rink in Center 70, and it, I'm assuming the retrofitting that it will take place will assist in letting it go a little bit longer, I guess. Through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, thank you, Councillor Amos. Um, yes, we'll be to Council uh, next Tuesday evening with a report on the ice and, and uh, sports fields rates, which is um, some work that we started during the pandemic. Um, the, we have held the rates as far as ICE are concerned. Um, we did that back in 2020, which was out of discussions with not only our user groups, but with our community partners as well, like Tourism Kingston. Um, we do have you know, capital surcharge on ICE and sports fields rates um, that uh, do go directly to, to capital upgrades. Um, but in our capital ask um, here tonight and also in it with our existing uh, whips, we do continue to work along with Director Canellos' team on the upgrades to, to all of our facilities. And I'm just gonna pass it over to CAO Hurdle too, if we can add to that question. Thank you, and through Ms. Mayor, I just want to add that the the rates are remaining the same. So the remain or the rates themselves remain unchanged, as uh, Director Turner explained. What we're seeing, though, happening this year is an increase in terms of usage. So as you know, in 2022, people start to come back, and gradually we're starting to see more usage. So in terms of overall increase, we're we're seeing a difference between last year's usage and, and this year. So that's why you're seeing a higher increase. Thank you. It's good to see our rec facilities being used uh, to their capability again. Um, shout out especially to uh, Ms. Turner. Uh, she's been great to work with in a different capacity. I'll just say that. And well done to your team. 
Excellent. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Stephen. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I am wondering about the summer parks program. So that uh, was rolled out in several parks across the city for, I believe it was a half day here and then a half day there. Uh, and then it went away for a bit in some places and then COVID. Um, yeah. Just wondering if this budget includes plans for that kind of programming for, I see neighborhoods are included here, but I just wanna ask about that, please. Turn it over to Director Turner, anything else? Through you, Mayor Patterson. So thank you, Councillor Stephen. Um, yes, this budget does include that. Um, what a little history on that. Uh, what happened was during the pandemic, um, some of our community partners did take on that work. Um, the Boys and Girls Club have been very successful at running um, those programs for us the last couple of years. And um, this, there will be status quo on the programs for 2023, but we're working with them on expanding those uh, programs for 23 and beyond. Thank you, that's great news. I know a lot of families who really appreciate that programming. Councillor Glenn. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for the report and for all the hard uh, work that's going on. Um, so I have two questions with regards to the recreation and leisure budget. So the first one is I noticed that in recreation programs, uh, there is a decrease in funding. Now, it, does that represent the fact that we're providing less programs or we have partners that are picking up the slack? I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn that over just to keep with the, the flow here to Director Turner. Through you, Mayor Patterson. Thank you, Councillor Glenn. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Is the, is the um, As we're uh, working with our community partners, um, more and more organizations who are subject matter experts in those areas are actually um, uh, advancing those programs for the city. So you'll see a decrease over the last couple of years in our programming budget, um, but those services are still being provided to the community. Thank you. And my, uh, my second question relates to uh, the art artificial turf fields. So I note that we're um, you know, increasing spending on those fields. My question is the, around the decision to provide artificial turf rather than grass, given the rate of injury that occurs from playing on turf. Um, turf toe is really awful. Um, so <laughs> I'm just curious about why the increased spending and the considerations around artificial turf versus grass. Through you, Mayor Patterson. So the um, the increase for the two artificial turfs are are the materials that we use to the rubber crumb and other materials that we use to keep the turfs um, as spongy or as soft as possible um, to avoid some of those injuries that that you're speaking about. Um, there is a need in the community for um, turf time, especially in the shoulder season. So a little bit different to grass fields where the grass field is primarily used, you know, May through September. Uh, we have a lot of sports that want to be outside on an artificial turf as soon as the snow is gone. And then they also want that opportunity to be able to play in the fall once our, our um, grass fields have closed for the season. Thank you very much for the explanation. I appreciate that. Councillor Sun. Thank you, uh, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, my question again is the, um, uh, I have two questions. One is the recreation and leisure service. I see um, only 50,000 for the neighborhood parks. And I have witnessed uh, in our district, uh, especially, there's a lot of uh, neighborhood parks are very outdated and the, place, uh, the play places are very outdated. Even the benches and chairs are uh, not in very, very good condition. And those parks are uh, mostly used by the old demographic, all, all the ages. Um, <clears throat> but I see only 50,000 available for that. Versus that, I see more money to the community centers and also um, yeah. is that uh, recreation programs, which is, I'm sure, that taken place mostly in the parks. Uh, I just want to know why we have you know, less money for the most important places to upgrade them and make it usable and useful for the community. Bruce. 
So if we could just turn it over to CAO Hurdle to, to start the answer on that one. Thank you, Anne-3, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so the, the budget that's in front of you um, right now is actually looking at programming only. This budget does not include any renovation or upgrades to, to parks. That was actually covered in uh, Commissioner Joyce's budget. It was under the engineering. So there was a capital line account, and I don't know all the details of what's in it, um, but Commissioner Joyce might have more information on that. There's definitely a significant allocation for park uh, renovations and upgrades. The uh, second question is about the um, uh, uh, climate uh, uh, programs. Um, I see that the uh, city has been allocated uh, a lot of funding for the better homes and many other initiatives. Um, I'm interested to know what kind of uh, a system or mechanism we have in place to measure the results out of those funding we given away and making sure that is working towards that great cause we we are uh, worried about it. Okay, thank you, and through you. So I'm going to just make sure I understand the question, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Soren Christensen, who is virtual. He's our project manager and, and leads that program. So um, you're asking, how do we ensure that we are getting results from, I would think, from a GHG reduction perspective for the spending that is that is that is happening in the Better Homes Kingston program, and that that funding is, is I think, is over 80% funded from uh, from FCM. But I'll turn it over to Soren Bizarre, who could explain the mechanisms of how we how we ensure that the program is is working and as intended. Yes, my question was not only with the particular home, the home improvement program, but all the other funding. We are encouraging the community to get involved and uh, do their own part. So I, I just want to know if we are providing money to the citizen or the community. That is the result driven. It's, it's making the difference. Okay, well, why don't we start with Soren so he can explain how the money does go out to the community through the Better Homes Kingston program for that, and I can, I can think about how else to, to answer your question. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, so yes, for the Better Homes Kingston program, monitoring and verification, actually there are two phases. Uh, so the program follows the EnerGuide rating system. This is the standard energy rating system across Canada for all home energy efficiency. Um, so the, the, the system follows um, reduction of gigajoules and also uh, tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we see actual reductions at the end of a project um, once the kind of the second audit has taken place, um, which verifies what has been completed. And what we are seeing so far uh, in Better Homes Kingston, the goal of the program was an average reduction um, of 30% uh, carbon impact per home. And what we are achieving so far is over 60%, so more than double our goal. And we will also be verifying this um, through utility bill analysis. So we have utility bill uh, waivers in the loan agreement that we administer through the program. And so not only will we see the results from the integrated rating system, but we're also working to verify it with utility bills. Um, and similarly for the Green Standard Community Improvement Plan, uh, we have verification um, methods in place. Um, to see the actual greenhouse gas emission savings and energy efficiency um, based on multiple compliance pathways that are available in the program. Um, and then in relation to other programs, for example, the Kingston Community Climate Action Fund, um, while greenhouse gas emissions may not be the only impact, um, we do see multiple programs with that focus, but we have uh, varied program criteria, and that could also include uh, solid waste diversion um, and other tangible and measurable impacts. Um, and for the Neighborhood Climate Action Champions program, another community-focused program, um, a program like that is really focused more on education and empowering uh, change at the household level, at the individual level. Um, so the majority of our major funded programs are um, verifying the impact, uh, like the, the numeric impact or um, environmental impact. And then we do also have 
uh, some other initiatives focused at the community level, which are more focused on education and empowerment. Thank you. I, I, th I think Soren covered it. <laughs> Thanks. Great job. Uh, Councilor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, uh, just one question, and it's about the uh, Sunday antique market. So is it in the budget for this year to bring back the antique market on Sunday? I think it falls in this portfolio, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Director Turner. Through you, Mayor Patterson, and thank you, Councillor Osanic. Um, so primarily what's happened historically is the, um, the uh, antique market was on an, uh, an RFP. It's not currently in this budget. On Sundays, we do have an Indigenous market down here. Um, I know that our team has been doing some work with um, some inquiries that have come in about the antique market and also with Loving Spoonful, who will be the new market um, provider, um, and trying to see how we can fit it all in to the space. We're also looking at some other um, uh, locations as well, um, and, uh, but it's currently not in this budget for 23. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, Commissioner Hugo Moss, thank you. Directors, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move to our next department presentation, which is corporate services. So we will invite uh, Commissioner Carboni to the podium, and then we will go from there. Okay, so thank you very much uh, through your worship. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening in front of council to, to present the 2023 uh, Corporate Services proposed budget. Um, I am Neil Carboni, Commissioner of Corporate Services. Uh, it's an extra pleasure for me to be here because it's the first budget I've been able to present uh, to city council uh, since starting with the city in 2022. Uh, but also because Corporate Services uh, does not uh, frequently get an opportunity to get in front of council to talk about uh, all of the uh, great initiatives and work that is underway within the corporate services portfolio. Um, so excited to do that here this evening. Uh, I'd just like to start with a quick overview of the corporate services group. Um, uh, overall, we're looking at a 2023 uh, net budget of 19.3 million. It's a variance of uh, 1.27 or 7.1% uh, increase overall. Uh, the Corporate Services Group is comprised of six departments uh, with a number of divisions within each and then two smaller divisions that report directly to uh, the Commissioner's Office. Uh, we're comprised of 200 employees uh, across all of those groups uh, and also some regular contractors around security and, uh, and maintenance and things like that. And, and a lot of our operations and uh, the things that you'll hear this evening are really driven by uh, the activities of a lot of our public-facing departments within the city. Uh, as corporate services, we are very internal facing and we provide service to those public facing departments. Uh, I'd just like to introduce uh, the team because we don't get an uh, opportunity to get in front of council that often. Uh, this is in the order that they are up on the screen, so not in the order of sitting next to me. Uh, first, uh, Deanne Rivera is our Director of Human Resources and Organizational Development. Uh, Spiros Canelos, our Director of Facilities uh, Maintenance and Construction Services. Uh, Jenna Morley, our city solicitor and director of legal services. 
Uh, our clerk's office that is represented by uh, Deputy Clerk Janet Janes this evening in the middle. Uh, our Chief Information Officer and Director of uh, Information Services and Technology, Jeff Bumstead. Uh, J.C. Kenny, our Director of Communications and Customer Experience. Uh, and then within the Commissioner's Office, uh, as I mentioned, we have our Manager of Insurance and Risk, Kelly Edwards, that I believe is joining virtually. That's great. Um, and someone you'll be very familiar with because of your Council Orientation Program, Mr. Rob Hosier, uh, our organization, Organizational Change Management Coordinator in the back. Uh, corporate Services Capital works uh, primarily within two departments, the Facilities Management and Construction Services. Uh, this year with a proposed capital budget of uh, just under 16 million and our information systems and technology uh, department which is just under six million uh, important to note that those capital works for each of those departments fall under uh, three capital envelopes uh, and the envelope system does provide uh, a degree of flexibility um, with uh, how we can prioritize certain capital projects uh, in given years uh, within facilities there is a heritage non-heritage and asset management envelope and within ISMT is a run, or kind of keep the lights on, envelope for capital, and then a secure and a growth and transformation um, envelope as well. Uh, moving on to our first department, human resources organizational development. Um, uh, we're looking at a 2023 uh, proposed operating budget of uh, 3.6 million. That's a variance of 251,000, or a 7.35% uh, variance for this year. Um, you will recall when we went through uh, some orientation activities that there is quite a bit of flux uh, in the workforce in the labor market right now that all employers, especially large public sector employers, uh, are uh, challenged with. Um, we have high turnover um, with the advent of the pandemic and remote work. Uh, there has been a lot of churn. And so over the last number of years, we've actually seen pressures, particularly on recruitment, uh, increase. We've actually seen recruitments over a number of years almost double. Um, and all employers are faced with some of the challenges around a retiring workforce as well. So for that reason, we have prioritized our talent management framework uh, this year, which we have talked about with Council. Uh, we've prioritized a number of succession planning programs, uh, health and well-being initiatives. Uh, we are preparing this year for QP collective bargaining because that contract does uh, expire at, uh, at the end of 2023. And we're looking at some technology upgrades uh, in partnership with ISMT, uh, specifically, specifically around uh, applicant management and time and attendance management. I think you will recall when we were speaking with um, uh, Treasurer Kennedy that we, uh, we have integrated systems with our uh, payroll and the rest of our financial system, um, but they are not the same system. And so we are looking at uh, future improvements in that area. Uh, in terms of our variances here, uh, there's a small variance around uh, CPIC reimbursement fees, but the biggest amount of that variance is because we have a new recruitment advisor that has been onboarded, and that's annualized for 2023, uh, in large part because that's where we're seeing a lot of our pressures. Uh, for facilities management and construction services, a really important thing to note here is that even though the net uh, 23 budget is proposed at 4.3 million, um, that's not really a reflection of the size of the department. The gross operating department, uh, or gross operating budget, uh, is just under 21 million. And the reason you see that significant variance, uh, I think roughly only 24% of, uh, um, of, uh, of that gross operating is reflected in the net, is because there's quite a bit of um, accommodation allocations or transfers from other departments for the facilities that uh, FMCS oversees on behalf of those departments. And there's also lease revenue that comes in uh, to offset a lot of those costs. So the budget alone doesn't quite give an accurate uh, picture of uh, the scale or the, the size of the department. Uh, in terms of priorities for 2023, uh, creation of a detailed net zero by 2040 uh, roadmap. Uh, that's aligning with uh, Council's cl approved climate action plans. Uh, continued centralization of utility accounts. Uh, development of a centralized energy model uh, for over 60 facilities that will help with planning and benchmarking moving forward. We're seeing a continued shift in management of the city's facilities to a centralized model. Uh, and I think it's just important to note uh, here that um, this has been several years in the making. I, I believe we're approaching 160 facilities within the centralized model. Uh, and what that has done is it has allowed us to focus on reliability-centered maintenance uh, and energy management, realize economies of scale, 
uh, with our service contracts, um, with parts and suppliers, uh, and make sure that we are heading off um, capital challenges and uh, with that reliability-centered maintenance program that we apply to those facilities, prevent major failures uh, or other issues that would cost us a lot of money um, instead of um, uh, making sure that we're investing small amounts on a regular basis to preserve the life of those facilities. Uh, this year we are onboarding, uh, or believe, beginning to onboard, I believe, uh, all of the library facilities within, uh, within the city. Uh, there's also uh, ongoing implementation of project management that is a, a kind of a community of practice um, that uh, is observed within FMCS and uh, other project management offices within the city uh, and we're constantly looking at um, improving and upgrading those processes um, and that includes up updates and regular review of our facility design guidelines. Um, and then there's a number of security measures that we're looking at um, at a number of our facilities. I uh, did note um, uh, before our approach to facility asset management, uh, so there is regular work done on building asset inventories and condition assessments so that we can take an asset management approach to the maintenance of our facilities. We can prioritize work, we can decide when uh, retrofits versus uh, you know, um, major capital work uh, or even facility divestiture is uh, the appropriate approach to take. Uh, we have centralized energy management, and I think you heard uh, from our asset and uh, our energy and asset management division at a recent orientation session about all the great work uh, that they are doing around energy ma ma management with our facilities. Uh, and then FMCS provides a lot of support to the EDI office um, around built form uh, EDI applications. Uh, some things planned for 2023 uh, include um, gender neutral. Uh, washroom signage and a program and communication rollout, uh, flagpoles in Confederation Basin and a number of other activities. A lot of the variance, the 7.21% within FMCS, um, is really associated with um, inflation and supply chain challenges that um, um, any department that uh, is procuring material services construction uh, would experience post-pandemic. Uh, but also because with our centralized model, we, we have a cap with, across other departments uh, for how much is transferred back um, um, to FMCS for the centralized work that is done. And so what that means is that if something comes up that is beyond that cap, then that balance is realized within the facilities budget. And over time, that does balance out so that we are apportioning things equally to the, uh, to the correct departments. In terms of facilities capital, again, as I said, we have three envelopes within the heritage property envelope, 2.7 million. Uh, that includes work to City Hall, the Frontenac County Courthouse, which is actually a city facility, um, and a number of other heritage facilities on Queen Street, the Jailer's Residence, uh, the British Wig Building across the street, and the JK Tet Center. For our non-heritage envelope, there's 10.3 million being invested. Uh, that includes uh, work at the Leon Center, at Rideau Crest, uh, at a number of Kingston Fire and Rescue facilities, uh, at our libraries, uh, and specifically design and permitting in preparation for uh, renovation at Isabel Turner, and at a number of rec and leisure facilities. And then within the asset, asset management envelope, we have 2.8 million, um, and that's around energy and asset management work at a number of facilities, uh, health and safety, sure compliance, accessibility, and some security matters, uh, and some of those aforementioned EDI initiatives. Uh, moving on to the Office of the City Solicitor. Um, uh, you're very familiar with the work of the City Solicitor's Office. Uh, they're in front of you uh, regularly, uh, provide, uh, providing excellent advice and support to Council. Um, but behind the scenes, there is also uh, work that is happening with uh, our Provincial Offences Court. Um, obviously, post-pandemic, we are seeing activities ramping back up, uh, and so you will see um, a uh, related increase in Provincial Offences revenue. Um, and um, post-pandemic, um, continuing to ramp up on the transfer of uh, Part 3 administration uh, from the province uh, to the city. Uh, also, you know, there is uh, increasing work related to uh, appeals at the Ontario, Ontario Land Tribunal as a result of some of the implications of Bill 23 and other legislation, and so there's anticipation um, that there will be more work in that area um, and potentially associated cost uh, with the cost of appeals. And then lastly, although it might be a smaller portion uh, of uh, legal services work, uh, there is an intense focus on cybersecurity and legal's involvement in the cybersecurity preparedness activities that we have within ISMT and insurance and risk. 
Uh, in terms of the variances from uh, the 2023 proposed budget, which is 772,000, uh, variance is only 36,000, a 5% uh, change. And a lot of that is associated with um, increases in um, uh, budget for uh, anticipated OLT appeals. Um, there's a slight change around uh, staffing with, to provide some more support to uh, legal services, uh, converting an articling student to a junior legal counsel. Uh, and we are seeing increases in provincial offenses revenue, which actually keeps that variance as low as it is. For the Office of the City Clerk, uh, we're looking at a 2023 proposed budget of just over $2 million. It's a variance of 185000 or 10.05%. Uh, uh, if you're looking at the roll-up for the Clerk's Office within the budget, you will see a lot of variation um, and flux between 22 and 23. That is largely because of all of the transfers from reserves and the cost of operating the election in 2022. So you see a lot of those things fall off, both on the revenue side and the expense side in 2023. Uh, this year, the uh, Office of the City Clerk is going to be collaborating on some software rollout along with IST. Um, you will hear more about this platform cascade. It is the platform that we use to track um, all of our strategic plan actions and initiatives uh, over the course of the term of council. And so once you conclude strategic planning, the clerk's office is going to play a role um, in putting all of that into that platform. And that's the platform that we use for regular reporting to you and uh, the rest of the community and that we use internally to track those work plans. Uh, we're looking at new agenda management software, which is going to um, uh, provide more accessibility and enhancements to how the public can access all of our uh, council, committee, and other public records. Um, the clerk's office plays an important role in the implementation of our multi-year accessibility plan, and the clerk's office works closely with the EDI office as well. Uh, in terms of variances, um, the annual election transfer has actually changed, and so that's a significant portion of this. Uh, in the uh, previous four years, uh, the transfer was, I think, 200,000 per year to reserves in preparation for the high cost of the election in 2022. We've upped that to 250,000 per year transfer to the reserve, anticipating a higher cost of running the election in 2026. So that is a big portion of that variance. Uh, we've also seen uh, postage increases, which uh, is actually pretty significant. You'd be surprised. Um, but we're seeing things go back to pre-pandemic levels with a lot of the statutory notices that have to go out with a lot of the activities that our print shop, which is part of the clerk's office, does on the part of other departments. Um, and so there is higher cost there. And then because we have moved uh, most of our meetings to hybrid meetings, um, we are seeing almost double the staff resources required at those meetings to maintain um, uh, them in a hybrid uh, state. So we've got meeting management happening and committee clerks that are presiding over the meeting as well. So you're seeing increased staffing costs in that area. Uh, for information systems and technology, we're looking at a 2023 proposed operating budget of 4.5 million. That's a variance of just under 200,000 or a 4.5% variance. Um, one of the important activities this year is looking at a digital strategy for the city. That's really to determine how we want to go forward with technology solutions. What approaches do we want to take? How do we want to approach cloud versus in-house? Uh, so it's uh, some important decisions that need to be made there uh, that will guide uh, some of our application of new technology uh, and how we um, uh, look at enhancements or improvements. Um, there is a comprehensive security strategy that IST leads. They obviously work closely with insurance and risk um, and our legal team on that. Um, they are working closely with the clerk's office on ongoing AODA requirements. Uh, while we are generally compliant, there are always changes, and as we bring on new technology or as technology changes, we have to make sure that we continue to be compliant. Uh, investing in a number of different technologies to improve efficiency and automation and try to um, free up more staff time that we can allocate towards higher value activities. Um, and then things like the My Kingston platform, which is uh, public facing and provides for kind of personalized access, um, uh, self-serve access to a lot more information, certainly more accessible than having to navigate the current uh, city website. Variances within IST, uh, we are seeing um, increased costs around licensing for software um, platforms and from vendors. Some of that is vendor driven, especially if there's limited options within any, any particular space. But as we add new technology, as you onboard new staff, or as you start implementing new technology for those staff, licensing fees increase. So that is something that we're always mindful of. 
Uh, there's also cybersecurity costs. Uh, there's investments that we have to make, especially as we onboard new technology or as we have to keep up to date with cybersecurity provisions. Um, things like two factor authentication, for example, like with your mobile devices. Um, there's costs associated with those things. Uh, we have some minor increased staffing costs, although a large portion of the ISNT budget is actually allocated to capital projects. Uh, I think roughly 50% of the staff, or 46% of the staff, 45% of the staff, is allocated back to capital works across the corporation. Uh, and then we are increasing our contributions to capital in anticipation of life cycle work and other capital investments around technology. For ISNT Capital, as I said, there's three envelopes there. There's the run envelope, which is essentially the keeping the lights on and maintaining the technology that we have. There is the secure envelope, and there is the growth and transformation envelope. And I just want to note, you see kind of a small number there, only 300,000 uh, under secure. Uh, that is not a reflection of low investment in that area um, because within the run portfolio and within the uh, grow and transform portfolio, there are security uh, aspects uh, related to all of those programs as well. Um, so what you see under secure is really the very focused, kind of dedicated um, security measure that we might be putting through uh, whatever that solution, uh, capital solution might be. Uh, for some of those capital highlights, we are looking at redesigning the city's public-facing website. I think you heard that from some of the earlier groups. Uh, migrating applications to cloud where appropriate, again, considering licensing costs and cybersecurity. Uh, we're enhancing a lot of different um, uh, digital service delivery. We have talked about uh, our um, CRM tool at this table, talking about customer service standards and the importance that CRM plays. So ISMT does work closely with customer experience on updates to that platform so that we can end up developing and meeting those standards. Uh, I think you heard uh, at length from um, uh, CFO Kennedy um, around the upgrade of our financial system, Dynamics 365. Uh, that is a major focus for the ISNT group uh, in 2023. And we have legislative requirements under NextGen 911, and that's a collaboration with a number of different departments um, that the ISNT team will be working on along with um, fire and rescue planning and outside agencies. For the communications and customer experience uh, department, we have a gross proposed or a net proposed budget of 2.6 million. That's a variance of 103,000 uh, or 4.09%. Um, for highlights this year, we're looking at that partnership with the public facing uh, website. Uh, that's an exciting project, um, again, kind of co-championed by those two departments, but with implications across departments uh, in the organization. Uh, also, as I mentioned, we are looking at uh, updates to our CRM tools so that we are able to implement um, those customer service standards. Uh, we would not be able to really enforce or monitor those standards without some of those updates. So while yeah, I know Council has been getting updates on departments getting onboarded onto the tool, uh, we also have to make sure that there's functionality in there to be able to uh, have the accountability we need to implement standards. Uh, as part of that, we are looking at revisiting our customer service strategy um, and our channel management strategy. Um, and so this is actually good timing that we're looking at standards at the same time as we had um, a strategy update on our books for 2023. We're also looking at updating the city's public engagement framework, again with a lens towards marginalized groups um, and, and EDI. Uh, and our communications group plays a large role in a lot of the EDI initiatives uh, that I believe you're going to be hearing about uh, in a proposed work plan uh, at the next council meeting. In terms of variances, they're really staffing related uh, in this group, um, and that's because we had some changed classifications, and we actually annualized uh, a position that had existed, but because of some reorganization, there was a, a vacancy of the actual position there, so that position had to be recreated for 2020. Uh, it was done in 22, and so we're annualizing it in 23. Uh, Last but not least is the Commissioner's Office, uh, and this does look like a fairly large budget. It's because we are including the insurance and risk portfolio within the Commissioner's Office. So you will see in your binders a separate roll-up uh, for insurance and risk, um, but for these purposes it's contained within this slide. Uh, so a gross... <laughs> So a gross, uh, or sorry, a net budget of 1.2 million, that's a variance of uh, 211,000, or 
0.5%. Um, just to break that down, I believe 150 of that variance is because uh, of the addition of our organizational change management resource uh, and some uh, administrative uh, support uh, that wasn't in previous budgets. So that's within the commissioner's office. Uh, and then I believe we have about a $57,000 variance uh, in the insurance and risk budget. So only about 5%, 15% in the commissioner's office. Uh, we are looking at developing a corporate services strategic plan. As I said at the beginning, corporate service departments typically interact outwardly as opposed to aligning internally, and that's just the nature of the work that we do, whereas some of the other commissioner groups, you have a lot of commonality and synergy between the departments themselves because of the services that is delivered. So for 2023, we are looking at um, doing a strategic plan for the entire group so that we can uh, operate more cohesively and uh, understand um, how we need to be designed and structured moving forward. Uh, we are also looking at uh, supporting a broad corporate pri project prioritization framework that'll help us plan new initiatives and capital planning um, um, a little bit better. Uh, we have been a leader, especially with Rob's support, on the Council Orientation and Education Program, which is going to continue for the rest of the year. Uh, and hopefully council has seen uh, the value in that. I think we have a survey that's going out soon, so you'll be able to give us your feedback. Uh, we're looking at longer term workforce planning. The City 360 and Talent Management Initiative is extremely important, and so I'm working closely, closely with the, the director and the department on that. Uh, we have an IT governance framework uh, as well. Uh, and of course, we are expanding the role that Rob and organizational change management plays because we've seen a lot of positive impact from it being implemented in 2022 and now into 2023. Um, as I mentioned, the variance is uh, largely that new OCM resource um, and some admin support. And then for the Office of Insurance and Risk, um, uh, I believe that's about an $800,000 uh, net budget separated out uh, from the commissioner line that you see there um, with a variance of about 5% or uh, 57,000. Uh, the Insurance and Risk Office is going to continue to work towards mitigation and loss strategies. There's a new platform, Clear Risk, that we're looking to bring on with support from IS&T that's going to help us look at trend analysis and, and mitigate risk in different areas. Uh, we're looking to increase recoveries on different claims, especially when there's property damage uh, on city properties. Uh, and um, Insurance and Risk worked very closely with IST and legal on those cybersecurity initiatives that I mentioned. Uh, that $57,000 variance is largely uh, the result of um, just a, a more accurate estimating on uh, our recoveries uh, coming in from various claims. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, you clearly earned the $1.2 million we're paying you, Commissioner Carbone. <laughs> um, but seriously, folks. Um, my question is actually about elections. Um, how, do you know how much roughly the 2022 election costs the city? Madam Acting Clerk. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and for you, approximately $750,000. Okay, thank you. Uh, Follow-up question is, we're putting $250,000 per year. Is, am I getting background noise here? Uh, oh, 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 okay. I'm fine? Okay. We'll see. Um, so we're currently putting $250,000 per year. That's $1 million projected for the next election. Um, what do you attribute the rise in cost to? Is it just the administration costs are projected to increase, but that's quite above inflation and population growth? I'm just curious. Uh, yes, you hit those both on the head. Population growth um, and uh, cost of the provision of provision of the services. So the you know the cost of the online voting system, the cost of the uh, vote tabulators, that sort of thing. So the, the software. Okay, thank you. There are quite a few temporary employees that have to be brought on to actually operate the election too. So we're accounting for wage costs four years down the road. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I was very pleased to see in this document that there is going to be the creation of a detailed net zero by 2040 roadmap for city facilities. Um, I look forward to that. So my question is, does this include uh, sort of a midway target of a reduction of 50% greenhouse gases by 2030. I know there was a presentation in the previous council. Is that included? 
Uh, yes, through the plan, uh, we're looking at various scenarios for 2030, like 30%, 50%, and our 2040 plan, uh, we're also looking at the scenario of 80%. Okay, thank you. Is that something we can discuss at strategic planning later? Mr. Mayor? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Um, we can discuss anything you want. All right, well, we will be talking about this. I look okay. forward to it. <laughs> uh, my second question is, <laughs> uh, in the budget, it also mentions the creation of a digital twin for the city of Kingston. This sounds like Minecraft or SimCity. What is it really? <laughs> So through your worship, uh, the digital twin is, is essentially just referencing the uh, digital version of the city that we have within uh, within GIS. And I think it references LIDAR and photogrammetry there, uh, which is just continual updating of that data that provides us with information about tree canopy and building structures and, and things of that nature. I don't know if uh, C CIO wants to elaborate on that. Thank you. And through, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I think you heard uh, Commissioner Agnew reference it as well. So the digital trend is actually that. It's the digital rendering of the city. So for example, if a new building is going up, say a 16-story building, we can actually insert that in the plan and follow the sun and see how it will impact the, the shadows during the day, how it would impact the flight path of an airplane by inserting that building and seeing how the city moves around it. So it really is a, a three-dimensional image of the landscape in the city that we can insert and change to, to see different planning options. That sounds very cool. Also, I wonder if there's an opportunity to sell that um, for gaming purposes. I feel like someone could develop something fun with that. Councilor Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, since Councilor Tozo uh, stole my election question, I have a more esoteric one. Uh, this is a, regarding information systems and technology. I noticed looking at the variances in the budget that there's a considerable uh, cut to corporate integration. Is that simply because the program's been so successful or have there been some program changes there? Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. That's actually a combination of a few things. We did increase the allocation to capital of those resources because of that team is really concentrated on large business applications such as the uh, FMS migration that uh, that uh, the uh, commissioner mentioned in other uh, specific projects. So, so we made the decision to use up some WIP capital that, that we had and increase that allocation of that team to capital. So, so that's not really reflective of the size of, of that group as much as the uh, the amount of capital project work that they undertake. Thank you very much. Rostov. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and thanks for the presentation. I, um, I wanted to ask a couple questions, and, and if I'm confused, then you'll, I'm sure you can tell me or um, the, the, our, uh, our treasurer. Um, I'm just, I'm a little bit concerned about what I'm seeing here because I'm actually seeing increases all the way through, um, like uh, each office and the variances. I, I, first of all, I wonder what, how come we don't show percentages why do we just show, um, like, wouldn't that be easier for us to see if it's an increase or a decrease, and, or is that what the brackets are for? I'm just curious about that from an accounting point of view, like in our paperwork, what we read. Thank you, Councillor, to you, Mr. Mayor. So yeah, that is definitely something that we could take a look at. Um, we, we slice and dice it, as you know, a number of different ways. Yeah. And I'm just trying to think whether we have, I don't think there's a specific spot where we have percentages. No, um, no. Though I think we do actually put them in the council report itself is where we talk about it. it. It's more different. Yeah, so okay. that's certainly something we could take a look at. And, and I think you're talking about on the larger one that shows, it shows a variance yeah, for dollars, yeah. but not I, I missed that because um, for me, um, I find um, I mean, if I'm not reading it right, I, I know you'll tell me that, but each department, I mean, what, you know, for legal, it's 5.6, clerks is 10.05, and I, I like the explanations, but I would love to even see the breakdown to see why it's an increase. I think we, we could get a little more um, uh, detailed for us to, uh, to understand it. I mean, I would have considered that we could break out the change management, the insurance thing, because we know it's a big thing, so we, we can see it quicker, why, or easier, why it's uh, so much more. I mean, just to say, I know we can laugh that 20% is not 
It's not 20%, but it's still 5%. It's still more than we as a council were committed to or asking all our departments to be committed to. So, I mean, we're gonna have a struggle later uh, to actually approve all of that. And I just think that maybe it seems like, like, tell me where is the restraint in here? Where, where do you, how can you show us as councillors that you've shown restraint when we see increases right through? Uh, so uh, through your worship, um, I think important to note that with corporate services, while we do have a few larger departments for yeah. budget size, uh, we have a number that are fairly small. And so um, a, a, a small actual dollar change results in what looks like a large percentage. And so if you're not actually looking at the right. dollar figure as well, um, I mean, in the case of legal services, I think the 5% represents about $36,000. Right. Um, and so when you have small variances in anything from provincial offenses uh, to, I mean, one small adjustment of uh, the designation of one staff person that was already in the department, um, you will see that reflected as a larger percentage for those smaller departments. Um, also, corporate services, as I said at the beginning, a lot of the work that we do is driven by outside factors. So it's driven by council strategic priorities that have then trickled through some of the public facing departments and then we have to respond to those things. Um, in the case of things like facility um, uh, maintenance and construction services, um, there are asset management plans that are driving a lot of that investment. Um, or there are uh, capital works from other departments that uh, FMCS is, is involved in. So um, the commissioner's office, uh, you know, I think fair point that, that that's uh, a couple things that are rolled up together. Um, in the presentation, it was a single slide. In your binders, yeah. insurance and risk is a separate, um, a separate roll up, so you can see those numbers separately. Uh, sorry we didn't have those on the slide deck right. uh, for you. Um, but in the case of change management, when it is a department of one person and you add an additional person to it, again, it looks like a large percentage. Um, so th that's my best way to, to explain that is, yeah. um, I don't think it's for lack of, of showing restraint. I think probably corporate services has some outside influence from elsewhere in the corporation and some smaller sized uh, budgets that, uh, that result in what you're seeing as four or five, six percent, uh, seven percent variances. Yeah, and my comment would probably be right across the board um, and, and you know, the two nights too where we're, we're, we, it seems to me that, that, that we haven't seen as much restraint as we have during the pandemic and this is our time, but we do have a commitment to a certain percentage and uh, so we'll discuss that further later, but I do appreciate the work and the hard work that's being done. It's just, um, it, it just makes it more difficult for us later, but thank you. Ms. Kennedy, did you want to add something? Thank you, Mr. Marius. I just wanted to add, uh, Councillor, so on page nine of your binder, um, which I would say is probably the most important sheet in the whole binder for you, um, it's the summary by department. It also shows you all four years. I'm not sure why I didn't remember this when I say this is the most important sheet, but thanks to my staff here, it does show a percentage variance there. So if you run down there, you can see by department, and it, and it fairly clearly shows, particularly with some of the presentations you've heard the last couple of nights, you can kind of see um, some of those explanations within those, or where we're investing in, in priorities, and, and where we've had some challenges with inflation, as you've heard the last couple of nights. So if you just sort of go down that one column on there, um, it kind of gives you that story that I think you're, you're talking about by department. That's very helpful. Thank you for pointing that out to me. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Glenn. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for the report and for uh, all the hard work of keeping the lights on. Um, so my first question has to do with um, the report here where in HR we're indicating there's increased costs for the city's emergency assistance program. So I'm just a little confused here because I'm, I'm familiar with employee assistance programs. My understanding, though, is that emergency assistance programs are financially based and so I'm just curious what it is we're actually paying for so through, through uh, your worship that's actually a typo and it's I think the only one um, within, <laughs> within the corporate services um, uh, listing within the budget summary um, uh, there was actually a freeze on the cost of uh, EAP services for a number of years we are expecting a change because that freeze will lift next year not this year. So I think that was just an incorrect carryover of a comment, probably from a forecasted year. 
Okay, so that is employee assistance program? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and just out of curiosity, what kind of um, cost increase are we anticipating? Because I do know that um, fees for all of those programs are up everywhere, but what are we looking at? Director Roberts, did you want to respond? Hi, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so for EAP program, that's right now like $4 per employee for the number of employees we have. Um, as the commissioner said, we have been locked in for three years. We don't anticipate a huge um, increase in that. Um, we hover around $100,000, $105,000. We're anticipating probably $115,000 next year. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a, a question about the CPIC reimbursement. So um, are all employees at the city required to get a CPIC? Okay, and so just so we're aware, so um, the average cost for a CPIC now? So the average cost is about $30, $35, except for those people who have to go through more extension, extensive, which would be $65, $70. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and so then I have another question, and that's over uh, in the capital budget, where under other asset management, so there's a request a request of 2.7 million for support. Um, so I note in here that um, part of this is health and safety compliance programs. So can you just um, elaborate on what that entails? Sure. Um, yes, through your worship. Um, over the last five, six years, we've created uh, various programs like backflow preventing, uh, a backflow prevention program. Um, as we were centralizing the buildings, uh, we needed a pool of money as we're bringing the buildings on to address like backflow issues or arc flash, which is a rating of uh, somebody flipping a breaker and uh, the protective equipment that they need. Um, uh, this year for 2023, for example, um, some items under that is our security program and we're looking at uh, centralizing um, our systems for cameras and stuff. ISMT's done a great job um, setting the, the requirements, um, the guidelines for what we need. Uh, now we're implementing them as we're replacing cameras at uh, Rideau Crest, at 500 O'Connor, um, uh, British Wig, and even here at City Hall, uh, we're standardizing that program. So that's an example of a, of a health, example of health and safety in a current one. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions? Cal uh, Deputy Mayor Chinini. So, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, you guys were talking about investing in centralizing things, and so you're fronting a cost. Now, do you foresee a cost savings in the long run, um, and about how much would that be in the future, or not at all? <laughs> Uh, there's a, a variety of, uh, of savings that we're seeing through uh, centralization. So uh, one example is uh, a simple thing of um, uh, buying all our uh, filters for all our rooftop units. Um, uh, we ended up um, centralizing that a few years ago and there were significant costs, uh, about a 50% reduction in people going and buying their own filters. Um, on the energy uh, consumption side, we've seen significant uh, consumption uh, savings or avoided costs. Um, uh, we're also noticing uh, by centralizing from an asset rationalization point of view, if there's assets that we don't need, uh, like uh, this last year, for example, Bell Park Clubhouse uh, was uh, very old and outdated, or the Friendship Construction Building of Public Works, we demolished those. So there's a lot of um, uh, programs that we're doing that are generating uh, savings and economies of scale. Uh, I can give you lots of examples, but those are like uh, two examples, for example. All right, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much, Commissioner Caboni and directors. Uh, and with that, we will move to our final department presentation. Uh, we will invite CEO Hurdle back up to the podium to discuss the Chief Administrative Office.
Thank you, and last but not least, um, so the CAO's office, not really a full department, but a really busy place to be. Um, I am joined by Craig Desjardins and uh, Mohamed Hashan uh, virtually, so they're both um, on um, log logged into the meeting uh, in case you do have questions later on. Um, so the CAO's office operating budget Basically, we're looking at an increase that's slightly lower than 5% overall. I recognize that there are major variances in a couple of areas, and I will actually speak to those so to provide you greater clarity in terms of those variances. Um, first of all, starting with our Strategy, Innovation, and Partnerships office. So this is led by Craig Desjardins, who I believe you met uh, recently through a council uh, orientation session. So this particular group is quite busy, um, oversees grant administration, and as you can see, has been quite successful in not only applying, but getting grants for the city. A lot of these grants are capital grants, and they've enabled us to uh, accelerate projects or um, reduce our municipal financing towards a number of different capital projects. As you can see, we do have a lot of work underway with this group. We have 20 uh, new applications that are currently uh, being worked on for a total of, um, of about, um, actually I don't have this total, but it is uh, significant for um, this particular coming year. We do have uh, some changes that were made to this group over the last year. They've taken over the marketing aspect of um, the municipality. So we had marketing spread in different departments and it was consolidated into this group. And they've been working quite a lot on naming rights and sponsorship revenue. So they are gonna continue to increase that over the next year. One area that um, we, um, for those Returning counselors, you'll remember we had a partnership with KEDCO looking at a business support office person. We did implement this and KEDCO provided funding for a period of two years. Um, this partnership ends this year, so the contribution from KEDCO is not coming uh, in 2023, which is part of the variances that you're seeing, basically the increase of 168, so this actually contributes to the increase that we're seeing. Uh, this position has been quite successful for the city. We've received a lot of positive feedback from different business owners that have been working with this person and trying to um, advance various initiatives or projects. Staying with the Strategy Innovation Partnership Office, um, we have also added some additional support in terms of data collection and analysis. So this also contributes to the increase in this office. Um, this is really important in terms of decision-making process, so we wanted to make sure that we gradually increase our capa internal capacity for this. So when we're looking at the increase of 168,000, it's really composed of the reduction in the KEDCO contribution as well as this increase in terms of the uh, data collection analysis support. Uh, this particular group is, has been leading the Rural Economic Development Strategy, so for the rural councillors, you'll be uh, well aware that there's been a lot of great work done in this particular area, um, and that will continue over the next year. We are continuing our work in terms of workforce development, so we're doing a refresh, actually, of the um, uh, strategy that we have, which is a workforce development and migration strategy, was developed about five years ago. We're currently doing a refresh, and this very small group of people are also working on the family physician recruitment campaign. So as you know, council approved $2 million uh, last year for this particular initiative. Within a year, we already had 10 physicians that had signed up for this particular um, incentive that we were able to, uh, to ensure we're going to be practicing in Kingston. We do have a number of other physicians that we're currently in negotiation with, and we're gonna continue to do this work over the next year. Um, my biggest concern, to be honest, is that we're gonna run out of dollars uh, earlier than anticipated. So we may be having this conversation during strategic planning. 
Um, this group has also been leading the Kingston Health Innovation Project, so there was a significant amount of dollars that was provided through grants, uh, FedDev specifically, so this group will continue to lead this project, as well as trying to secure $3 million for the uh, Clean Tech Innovation Hub, uh, and this would be matching the city dollars that were approved last year for this initiative. Airport, which I know probably everybody wants to talk about. Um, so airport, I guess the good news is we're looking at um, a reduction in terms of property tax contribution to the airport. So I think all of council is well aware that the airport has suffered greatly during the pandemic. Uh, we had service obviously removed in terms of Air Canada and we were somewhat su successful in getting temporary service out of the airport in part last year. Uh, we had a bit of service for a period of time. Um, this, is not, this is not unique to Kingston. Actually, we're seeing large centers that are struggling with airline services. I'm sure for those of you who've traveled, you probably have experienced that. Um, so we will continue to focus on trying to get air service to return to the airport, but this is going to be quite challenging, to be frank. Um, we, in the meantime, are working on diversifying the uh, income or revenues we're seeing for the airport. So starting with uh, flight school that's going to be announced shortly, as well as collaboration with NAV Canada. We are also completing an airport master plan, which again will be submitted to council most likely in the next few months. Um, the CAO office, uh, this one not much of a change in terms of increase, uh, lots of work though to be done. Uh, as you know, we will be starting a process for strategic planning shortly, so part of my work will be to try to um, work with you and lead you through that as well as an implementation plan. I will continue to work on uh, enhancing collaboration with partners. This includes partners that we regularly, wor regularly work with as well as our regional partners, so as part of the mayor's initiative to, uh, to reach out to our surrounding municipalities and create more partnerships there. Um, so some of you might already know this, but uh, this may be new to others. I do play a significant role in terms of the city connection for tourism projects. So for example, when we talk about Kingston Penitentiary, those things are usually um, handled through my office. So I anticipate that I will also be playing a lead role in terms of the conference center from a city perspective. So those are gonna be projects that uh, will come up over the next year. EDI will continue to be a focus for my office. Um, we are looking at a strategic plan above and beyond the multi-year plan that was recently presented at the EDI committee and which will be coming to council at the next council meeting. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without health and homelessness <laughs> on this agenda. So this is something that I've been heavily focused on locally, working with partners, uh, addictions, mental health, et cetera, but also at the provincial level, mostly through the OBCM. And that's it for my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you, I think I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Glenn's question, if I, what she was alluding to. Um, in the package, um, it says the airport is going to generate $450,000 in new revenue. Is that the NAVCAN contract that you alluded to? Thank you, and through you, I'll get started, and I'm not sure if uh, I see Mr. Desjardins is actually on the line. So it would be um, primarily the, the flight school would be a portion of it, but I will let uh, Craig jump in as well. Uh, thank you, CEO Hurdle. Uh, yes, there's actually a number of sources of the revenue. Uh, one of them is the uh, the flight school, uh, but there's also a couple others. So again, part of the strategy of the new airport master plan is to uh, become more diversified. So we'll be making sure that uh, we're not uh, we're more resilient to any future uh, downturns. Is there a desire uh, down the road to perhaps um, approach? 
uh, an American airline to offer international service? Uh, through your worship to the councillor, that yes, that actually is part of uh, some work that's underway. Uh, we did actually receive some some potentially good news on Monday. Uh, our partner, uh, Pascan, uh, has announced that they are signing a complete code share agreement with Porter Airlines. Um, and Porter will be setting up a new uh, major hub in uh, Saint Hubert in Montreal, which is where uh, Pascan is based, and they'll be offering services to uh, 10 Canadian destinations, uh, including the West and East Coast. So, um, again, it's it's a very fluid uh, uh, space, uh, but we're very very active in, in pursuing every lead that we can find, including international American flights, including international. Okay, thank you. Councilor Glenn. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation, CAO Hurdle. Um, you didn't steal my question, but I, I thought we were maybe thinking on the same vein because I was going to ask about the um, supporting of a launch for the Center of uh, Healthy Aging. Uh, so I thought that might be up your alley. Um, so my question uh, is in what way are we supporting it, uh, particularly from a financial point of view, because this looks like it's basically um, a grant that they're reaching out for. Um, so I'm just curious what we're doing in terms of providing financial support. Great question. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to the councillor. Actually, the support is not financial. Uh, the support we're providing is actually uh, in-kind expertise in grant development. We're actually pursuing a rather large uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Research grant. Uh, it's about six, $6 million. Uh, so we're providing sort of expertise uh, in-kind sort of uh, time and effort for, from the city. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Councillor Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, this is around the strategy, innovation, and partnerships. Uh, it's the grants and transfers to other. That's the 1.153 million. Is that specifically for the physicians? I just want to make sure that I understand what that expense line is representing. Thank you, through you. So I believe there are a number of different grants and transfers to others that may be part of it because as part of our, our grant applications, we often apply in partnerships with other organizations and then we are the agencies transferring the grants. Um, I'll turn it over to Craig. He probably will have more details. Thank you, CEO Hurdle, Your Worship, through you to the councillor. Uh, so that that figure is actually the amount of the grants that actually is uh, part of the my team's uh, the, the money that the grants we actually get for my group. Uh, most of the grants that we get, about 95% of the grants that we get for the city, flow to other departments. So as part of the grants we get, uh, even those grants, um, most of the money flows out to other partners in the community. So that would be money that was either it would come in as a grant and then flow out as an expense to uh, to our partners. Um, so just as a follow-up question to that then, uh, thank you for the answers. Uh, so then when I look at the revenues and see the federal and provincial subsidies and I see that that's the 1.8 million, then that 1.153 is the outflow, is that correct? Okay, that's excellent. Correct. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, thank you very much, CEO Hurdle. Okay, so uh, with that we will move to uh, item six on our agenda, which is the 2023 operating and capital budgets. Uh, so um, the first thing I'm going to ask is for a mover and a seconder to put the budget as drafted by staff on the floor. Moved by Deputy Mayor Chinani, seconded by Council McLaren. Okay, so the budget that has been presented is now on the floor. So at this point, uh, we will open up the floor to any discussion uh, proposed amendments or whatever else might uh, be have. So first, uh, my list is um, Councillor Shapes. Sorry, I'd like to present an amendment, please. Okay, so we have a motion to amend, uh, it's moved by Councillor Shaves, seconded by Councillor Rosanic, that the 2023 municipal operating budget for transportation and public works, Kingston Fire and Rescue, be increased by $740,000 to facilitate the hiring of 12 additional firefighters in 2023. 
Okay. So uh, just before I give the floor uh, back to you, Councillor Shapes, so remember that we are tonight in Committee of the Whole. Committee of the Whole means that there can be multiple rounds of speaking, so it's not like Council where you can only speak once. However, I will still hold people to a five-minute timeline and do rounds of speaking. Okay, so just want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, so, Councillor Shaves, uh, your motion to amend is on the floor, and I will hand the floor now over to you. Thank you. Um, the report was presented to Council several months ago to increase the, the staffing for firefighters, including a new fire station. This is something that's been, I'll say, neglected for the last 20 years. Uh, the West End population has grown 33 by 33% during that period of time with no increase in firefighters or a new fire station, which has increased the response times to the residents in, that, in those areas. A night or two after that report was presented, um, I was speaking with some firefighters and there was a call uh, made to a fire. Uh, and then the second response team was at on its way to attend, it was diverted to a motor vehicle collision. And then there was a second motor vehicle collision. So it may not happen very often, but sometimes the second response doesn't get there. And this 12 officers, firefighters, and the eight for next year will help complement that at a current station. So I do ask if you can support this motion because this involves property and life, and I find that very important. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? Take the chair and recognize you. Okay. Um, maybe I'll start with a couple of questions, if I can. Can I just see the, the motion to amend again? Okay, so I think my first question is to staff. So if we, I'm trying to understand what the difference is between a budget with this amendment versus without. So if we were not to support this motion to amend, would these additional 12 firefighters still be hired? They would just be hired at a later date. I'm just wondering if if staff could explain what, what is the difference here between what's on the floor versus what staff recommended. Yes, thank you and through you. Um, so what we had planned and what we had presented to council was a plan that would start with hiring eight firefighters in 2024. And then for the uh, next three years beyond that, we would hire an additional four each of those three years for a total complement of 20 firefighters. This would uh, change it somewhat in, in that we would hire the 12 firefighters in this year. That effect on the budget is the $740,000 that's noted on there to the operating budget. Next year in 2024, the the, sort of the, the, the operating budget impact would be about $773,000. And that's based on hiring the 12 this year. And where we were planning to hire the eight next year, we would still hire eight next year. The difference being though that we have to pay for the 12, of course, uh, that we've hired this year. So the net impact for the 2023 operating budget is a $740,000 impact. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Councillor Shaves mentioned that, that yes, there's more investment needed in fire services. I think we all agree with that. The one piece was additional staffing. The other was the new West End Fire Station. So, one of the, one of the concerns that I know has been expressed is that because there have been delays, some assurance that that West End Fire Station could in fact be constructed uh, in this term of council. So, I guess my question to staff would be, is it realistic with the existing plan that we could have a shovel in the ground on the new West End Fire Station by the end of this term? Absolutely. Okay. My next question, so $740,000, 
that's a big increase in the budget. Can I ask what would be the tax property tax increase associated with that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the property tax for 740 would be about a 0.3% increase, um, which would be the equivalent of about $11 for an average household. Okay. Okay, so here's my dilemma on this. Right now we are at a 2.46% increase, but we also know that staff are recommending a 0.7% increase on homelessness supports. My concern is I can't support both. If we do both, we're looking at a full percentage increase. We're up to about 3.5%. My concern is that's too high. It's high at the best of times, but let's face it. Right now, people are struggling financially. Can I actually ask a question? Are we expecting an increase in the number of people that may struggle to, make, to pay their property taxes on time this year? Uh, through Mr. Mayor, I might, I might just ask that question of, of uh, Jeff Walker. He is online, okay. and he might have a, a better feeling for what we're seeing in terms of a payment of taxes. Sure. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship, we are seeing an increase in the number of people that are falling into arrears. It's not out of line with what we have uh, experienced in other years, but um, obviously the increases in taxes are significant to people that are struggling at this time. Okay, I think we're all aware that with rising interest rates, particularly with people having to renegotiate their mortgages, I'm very, very concerned about the financial health of many people in our community. I feel like this is an important time to signal to our community that we are hearing those voices and that we do everything we can to try to limit the property tax increase as much as possible. Well, this is budgeting, right? Budgeting is about making choices to say, okay, well, then what, what is the priority? How do we manage this? Obviously, fire service, very important, and I'm very happy to hear we can get a shovel in the ground on the new fire station by the end of this term. My concern is we need those homelessness supports. If we don't invest in those, we're going to have to close some of our shelters because we won't have funding for them. So what is the, what is the bigger priority? Of course, both are important, but if budgeting is about priorities, I think we have to make space for that extra 0.7% that staff are recommending. So for that reason, I have a concern. I don't think that I can support a budget with a three point, almost 3.5% tax increase. I just don't think that's the signal or the message we need to send to our community. So that's my concern with this. I would much rather instead be able to make sure that we can commit to that investment in that West End fire station, get those things moving, and let's move ahead with the homeless supports. By all means, next year, Right, we've got room, then we can, if we can accelerate staffing for fire more, then that's what we do. But my concern is that I think we need to show our community that we're making those tough choices and making sure that we're keeping the ability to pay in mind, given the financial pressures people are facing. Thank you. Can I return the chair? Okay, next time this is Councillor Tozo and then Councillor Ostrov. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I think Mayor Patterson has brought up some really good cho choice points about making sure that we're signaling to the community that we have, um, we're keeping our taxes on the lower end. Having said that, um, I think that what we also need to look at as a council is making appropriate investments in things that have been backlogged for a long period of time, both in the community and in our fire services. Um, Councillor Shaves said that this motion was about helping the West End. Um, I have to say, I find that train of thought very problematic. I don't like the idea that we're dividing the city between West End and downtown. I don't like the idea that we're dividing the city between West End and East End. We're Kingston. If the West End has a fire problem, Kingston has a fire problem. Um, I think even if the tax rate is at 3.5%, we're still at the lower end of where other municipalities are doing and are going. 
This to me is a time of investment. It's a time to show the community when I was knocking on the doors, they want problems fixed. Fixing problems costs money. It, and it's we're asking the people of Kingston, we have a problem with our fire services, let's fix it. So I would encourage this council to vote for this amendment. I would also encourage the council to vote for our housing and homelessness amendment. We'll speak to that later. We have problems in our community. We're asking people to contribute a little bit more to fix some of the problems. Thank you. Thank you, next is Councilor Osterhoff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. And um, well, there's you know, obviously two opposing kind of views there. I, I, I did appreciate uh, both comments and, and the passion behind them both. And, um, um, but I, in this case, I, I, um, I've been all over the map on this one because I care, I care as well, equally uh, as much for our fire and our housing, and uh, we have to make some difficult decisions, and uh, that is our responsibility. But um, to be clear, I wanted to understand, like, the hiring of the additional staff, it, it feels to me like it's too soon. That like we're building, why couldn't we be more gradual and uh, get, the, get, the, get the new station built and then in 2024, we would equip it. Um, I just think that um, but this, this is a time that we can't rush in um, uh, and, and, and just tell our community, well, we, ha we all have to contribute now. I, I think it's too early for that coming out of the pandemic. We're seeing um, the, an increase all around. I think it requires more gradual than I believe our community would uh, will understand it or will accept it better. And uh, um, that if we just go with the 12 now, I think that we should consider what management originally offered to us. So that seemed to be a wiser way to move forward and a, a, a better managerial approach and, and um, um, financially responsible, I think, to, to our community. So it's differing than your view. I totally understand it, but um, I, I feel that we should uh, exercise and show um, just the, the right balance of restraint and also vision moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Senek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I support this motion. I, not only do minutes count, but <laughs> seconds count, right? Like we have to remember it's not just fires, but they also come sometimes as the first responder, you know, to calls when someone's having a medical emergency and their air, airway is blocked and it's seconds where your brain is not getting oxygen and it can make such a big difference. Um, and in terms of fires, just in my last term of council, right, three houses in my district have burned, right? It was one house in Westwoods, and it actually went over to the neighbor's house, and then another house on Bath Road. And when you walk by those houses, like that's entire lives destroyed. Luckily, it wasn't people that got injured in those fire accidents, but it could have been if um, the fire trucks didn't arrive as fast as they did, right? maybe we got lucky and uh, you have to think too for insurance reasons you know if our response times get too low are too high. I mean, it takes too long to get to an accident. Um, there could be, you know, uh, financial penalties for the city, you know, with some lawyer that, you know, tries to sue the city saying that our response times weren't uh, good enough. Now, I've been around this horseshoe for a long time. In my first term of council, 2006-2010, is when we were presented the um, fire master plan. You guys think that this binder was big for budget? The fire master plan? was this thick we and it took many many meetings at arts recreation and community policy study to go by um, go through that binder we did a little bit at a time and by 2010 we had endorsed the master plan the master plan was supposed to be finished in 2018 that means that all the recommendations in that plan were supposed to be done and that included this hiring, but we delayed the hiring because, uh, you know, for financial reasons. And then in the last term of council, 2018 to 2022, with the pandemic, we again pushed out some of the hiring. And so now is the time. We we can't afford to keep pushing it out. And so um, I appreciate that. Yes, we have to respond to homelessness. 
and uh, we have the increase in the budget, but this is really important as well. And if it does come to nickel and diming to find that 750,000, maybe we have to go through our budget you know, uh, papers tonight and try to find some other way to take out 750,000. But just like Councillor Tozo said, is that when we look at our comparators, like, I don't want to go up to 3.5, but seconds count when you have a fire and your house is burning to the ground, or if the fire truck is going to be the first responder and someone is not getting oxygen to their brain. You know, that's really important uh, to me. And uh, when I was talking to um, some of the firefighters, um, this is about staffing. So it's not so much as, you know, the new fire station, it's... Um, Staffing, if we can get these um, 12 firefighters, we can have another complement on a truck um, at one of our existing stations right now, which will help them respond faster uh, when they get called. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Councillor McLeod. Thank you. How many families are likely to lose their home as a result of this tax increase? Like how many are being forced to sell or get out or evicted as a result of a tax increase because they can't pay that, may I ask? Are, are staff able to answer that question? No, unfortunately not. I would okay, not how, many, how many tax um, delinquents um, might there be in any given year and is the trend going up or down? Um, that we could probably answer and I'll, I'll refer that over to Mr. Walker. In a given, sorry, were you Mr. Mayor? In a given year when we begin uh, registrations for tax sale, which is just a farm debt and bankruptcy notice that goes out, we would be sending between about 100 and 150 properties those notices that then through each step pairs down. Um, we don't end up selling a lot of properties, but that doesn't mean that people themselves do not choose to sell their property. So that is not, I'm not saying that that's not an outcome of it, but. Thank you, but there is between 100 and 150 people who um, are struggling beyond um, just being able to pay their taxes and are actually unable to and may in fact be forced to sell when they wouldn't want to, and that kind of stuff. That's at the very least that we can uh, get from these numbers? Through you, Mr. Mayor. That or look at remortgaging, renegotiating other debts to look at coming up with a sum to pay on to the taxes, yes. Thank you. How many fire, or how many houses do we lose to fire every year at present? Do we know how many houses were lost last year, for example? Commissioner Joyce? I don't have that uh, exact information on, on hand. So um, would it be higher or lower than 100 to 150? It's lower. Smaller? Um, lastly, if we were not to pass the uh, homelessness um, surcharge or surtax, um, how many people are likely to remain homeless that we would otherwise be able to house? Uh, CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, at a very high level, and thinking of two major initiatives that are funded with these dollars, we would be seeing an additional about 40 people that would become homeless that would no longer have uh, a space to go to. Okay, thank you. And um, if we were to hire 12 today or something like that, or after this budget is passed, do they have somewhere to work, as in, is there a fire station? Are there enough trucks? Do they have enough equipment? Or would they just be um, lightening the load for existing firefighters? Uh, they would be assigned uh, out on the west side to our stations. Are they undermanned or underperson filled right now? So they would be used to um, provide additional response, particularly with respect to uh, secondary calls. And they have the equipment to do that? Uh, part of the operational cost, the 740000 includes uh, some of that equipment. Thank you. So all that I got out of that is that it would seem that we may be affecting more adversely 
a greater number of people by passing this this time than otherwise. Um, but it's still very foggy numbers, and I'm, <laughs> I am torn. Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I too feel this conundrum. Um, I can so appreciate the comments about keeping tax rates low. We've all heard from people in our communities who are having a hard time. I think, though, that there is an assumption in the community that when emergency response is needed, it will be there. And what I've learned recently through our fire department is that that may or may not be true, which is really concerning. I think it's important that people do have peace of mind. I want to also have us consider, again, the new fire station is needed. I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's coming. But I think we need to also acknowledge that a fire station doesn't help people. The firefighters are the ones who do. And so if we are starting them off spread out through the West End before they can get into their own proper station, um, personally, I still think that that is better for our community than not. Finally, I think it's worth considering that a new firefighter hire, their salary is about half, I think, of an experienced firefighter. And I do understand, maybe um, Commissioner Joyce could speak to it, but we are expecting some retirements of firefighters. Is that correct? Through you, uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, we are anticipating two retirements in 2023. and possibly up to 10 in 2024. And of course, we, we do plan, so we've already started on our recruitment activities uh, for that. Okay, so it seems to me that there will be some budgetary implications there. Um, perhaps, uh, Ms. Kennedy, you could speak. I, I understand there's also a tax assistance program, which I'd just like to ask about. Uh, yes, thank you uh, to you, Mr. Mayor. So um, there is a couple of, of tax programs. I'm just pulling them up so I have them on my screen here. So um, most of our, our tax programs relate to uh, our income related. So we do have a seniors property tax credit program. There's another uh, tax deferral program. Um, and so they are all related to whether someone is on like a guaranteed annual income supplement. So it's all based on what their, uh, what their income level is. But there are some of those that are available today. Okay, so if some if there is a senior on a fixed income, a pension, uh, would they qualify, or does it depend how much they receive? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So it would depend on their income level whether or not they would qualify. Um, I feel deeply uncomfortable about this, but I think that I need to support this motion. It feels like the right thing to do. It's not an easy, easy decision, um, but that's where I think I stand. Okay, next is Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Again, I apologize for not being there in person. I'm fighting the flu right now, but um, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said tonight. On one hand, uh, you know, you, you are always concerned about tax increases, and uh, I'm probably one of the ones that's that's usually always advocating to keep them lower. Um, we'd always like to see them be lower. Uh, this is also one of those situations where we're, you know, coming out of the pandemic, the city's coffers are all but empty, and uh, there's obviously hard decisions to be made. We've had a great increase in population in the city over the last 20 years. Uh, we can look at the police budget, which was 4% increasing, adding eight new officers and four new civilians. We can look at regional um, and uh, land ambulance adding new officers, or sorry, uh, new paramedics, and uh, all those things, recognizing that as a city, We've always struggled to keep up with uh, with our rising population and the demands that it puts on emergency services. Uh, I heard this going door to door uh, throughout the East End and uh, throughout the entire election in many places in the city where, you know, people have real concerns that these numbers have not increased over the years. Um, with that, uh, you know, the housing and homelessness, I don't see this as an either or. Um, you know, I think we can support both. It will definitely increase the tax rate. 
my frustration though is that with the housing and homelessness uh, 0.7% in the addictions is again this is where a city you know has had more and more of that downloaded onto them by the province and and the other levels of government and and we're struggling to keep up and the way that we do this is we constantly starve our own resources and so for many many years we've tried to go to the few things that we can control and we've seen that within our budget and unfortunately it often falls back to emergency services and then we starve those things and that's why we get these dilemmas on these days where all of a sudden now you're looking at a, a much larger increase to, to fill a gap which we know is there. Um, residents know it's there. They sense it as well. And we always seem to take from our own departments because that's what we uh, can ultimately control. But we've seen, you know, the land ambulance and the police are getting increases this year in an attempt to keep up. And uh, so fire obviously, you know, I, is, has, you know, need, has those needs as well. It's, uh, it's something where, you know, we have to consider the fact that it does take time to train them. Um, so if that new hall is going to be built, uh, it's got to be staffed properly, or again, we'll just have a building that's empty. And uh, I believe Councillor Stephen mentioned that it's not the building that really matters, it's the people in it. Um, also, uh, Councillor Sanding pointed out, you've got not just fires, you know, you've got medical, auto extrication, um, all these other different things that they go to and just public assistance. So this is something where this is one of the primary responses when people call 911. And if there's concerns across the city that, you know, when they call 911 and, and, and there's nobody to dispatch, I think that's something that we have to deal with uh, and take very, very seriously because it's going to be scant comfort to somebody to find out that there was a new turf field, uh, you know, built in their area of the city uh, when their house burns down because there wasn't enough people to respond to that emergency. So this is something that although fiscally, you know, it, it is it is very hard to to increase the budget. It's also something where, you know, morally you have to look at this as the right thing to do. I don't think anybody wants to get a call saying, hey, you know, you voted against that. Uh, thanks, because when I called, there was nobody there because they were already asked some other calls. And, and I, I get that from a budget perspective, this is tough. I'd love for us to be able to go back and look at the housing and homelessness strategy and that 0.7% tax increase, because I've gotten multiple emails about why is the city taking this on? This is by rights. We should be getting more support from the other levels of government. And I completely agree with those emails. We've been left with an addiction, mental health, and housing and homelessness crisis, and, and we're floundering with limited resources to try to deal with it. And this is another attempt at throwing 0.7% at it of money that we don't really have. And we're just trying to basically shore that up. But at what cost? Where are we taking that money from? And where have we taken it for the last 20 years? So I think it behooves us to, to basically support this because what are we going to do? Put it off another two years, another three years? There's never going to be a better time than now. These things are never going to get cheaper. So with that, um, you know, as much as it does put up the rate, I, I think each one of us has to decide for ourselves because we answer to our residents and the citizens of this city. And I don't know about you, but I personally don't want to get the call that, well, my house burned down because nobody was there to respond to it. So I'll be supporting this, and I hope that we can find some other savings somewhere in the budget to help offset that tax increase. Thank you. Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. A uh, question for staff. Where does 3.5% put us in comparison to same-size cities? Where do we rank? Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, through you. Um, so 3.5 is is one, it's still one of the lowest. Um, if I recall correctly, I believe we had City of Ottawa is at 3.1, and I believe there was one other municipality that was at 3.5. Um, the majority of the other ones that I'm aware of that have approved so far are higher than that. Thank you. When was the last time a, a bulk or um, firefighting units were increased in this city? Thank you. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the last time there were any significant significant increases were uh, over 20 years ago. So a, a general question, what was the size of the city 20 years ago, and what is our population today? I see you, Hurdle. Thank you, Andrew. I, I do not have the exact data in terms of the population of the city uh, 20 years ago, uh, but I can tell you that generally speaking, based on the Stats Canada census, our uh, 
rate of growth has been generally slow, um, between 1% to 2%, except for the last census that we saw an increase in terms of our population of about 7%. So we're not sure what the actual number is, because I've heard a number of people say it's 36,000, 16,000 in certain areas, 35,000 in certain areas in population growth. Um, basically, our city has grown uh, in the last 20 years, and our, one of our core uh, units that responds to any sort of emergencies has not grown with it. And I know a number of councillors have mentioned this already, that our firefighting units don't just answer the call to fires. Uh, they are community support in various other ways. And I know that the Housing and Homelessness Initiative is, is also a, a top concern for us as council, and I'm right there with you. Uh, I don't, I, I guess I don't see this as either or. I see both of these priority as priorities and knowing where we sit in the tax rate in comparison to same size cities or, or like size cities, um, like Councillor Bohm has said, I don't want that email, I don't want that call, I don't want that conversation on the street that um, I phoned 911 and I didn't get a response uh, from a firefighting unit. Um, and I feel a moral responsibility to ensure that we take care of our most vulnerable uh, especially in this climate that we're dealing with right now. So I see this as both priorities and I'll be voting for both. Okay, um, so yes, so I will do a round two. So what happens is if you put your hand up and you haven't spoken in the current round, then I give you priority, otherwise I put you on the second round. So uh, still on first round, Councillor Glenn and then Deputy Mayor Chinani. Councillor Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, so I have a, a couple of questions to ask. So I've heard everyone talk about the fact that um, our fire service responds to calls that are not fire related. So I'd like to know how many of those calls or what percentage are medically related and possibly should be going someplace else. Um, so this is also about proper utilization of resources. So my concern is that we are using our fire services in a way that they shouldn't be used in the first place. So sh we should be asking, I think, some deeper and harder questions on this before we move anything forward. I'm deeply torn. Um, my concern is always for the health and well-being of uh, the people in this community, but I want to know um, about that. So that's, that's my first question. I have a couple more, but if, if somebody could address that first. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you. Uh, so we do have a tiered response in the city of Kingston, um, and that's largely because uh, fire units can generally get to the scene faster than um, paramedic units uh, are able to. For percentage-wise, I don't have that stat on hand, but I can certainly get that. Okay. Um, is there some way that we can get even a snapshot of that? Does the fire service not keep a dashboard running of some sort so we can see what they're responding to? And possibly could somebody pull that quickly while we go to a couple of other questions? Um, so my next question relates to both fire and the homeless situation. So I'm looking to find out how many of the calls to the fire service are related to the homeless population? Um, and is that skewing, uh, again, the resources and the use? Because if the homeless population is, is uh, a large factor in this, then do we not need to be putting more resources to fixing that so that, again, we're not overusing the fire service? So can anybody address that? Commissioner Joyce? So certainly we've seen an increase in the last few years um, due to the mental health and addiction crisis. Uh, that's been noticeable across all of Ontario, uh, frankly. So we're certainly not unique in that regard. Um, because of the location of the integrated care hub, we have a higher density of calls in that area specifically. 
Um, and so overall, do we have an increase in those kind of responses? Yes, absolutely. I don't have the exact percentage and, you know, we'd have to look at what, what uh, we would compare that with, you know, pre the opioid uh, epidemic period or, you know, what, so. Okay, thank you. Um, and then going back to our property taxes. So we're talking, you know, percent increases. So my question is, um, you know, and I, I hear it frequently, that Kingston's property taxes are higher to begin with. So when you tack on percentage uh, values to that, that means a larger increase. So can someone speak to what our property taxes are comparatively to other municipalities of a similar size? Not talking percentage, absolute value dollars. Ms. Kendi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, I don't have that information readily available. Um, we are looking at that actually and doing some analysis on that uh, before we're bringing the, the final tax rates. Um, the one thing that I caution, it's very difficult to do, particularly with the levels of assessment and the proportion of assessment between commercial, industrial, and residential. So we have a very high residential, multi-residential percentage. Um, and so when you're comparing to some of the, particularly the larger cities where they've got a large commercial base, um, it's difficult to compare that without looking at, at both pieces of that. Okay. Um, so then my last question actually isn't one that I want answered. It's a bit more of a thought question for everyone. Um, so if we move forward with this, where are you going to take the money from? Because we have to serve all the citizens of the community. So that's my question. Where are we going to take this from? Where are we going to get it from? That's it. Okay, next is Deputy Mayor Chinani. Through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, questions about, um, there's gonna be retirees, um, so like three, this two or three this year, and 10, I can't remember the number, about 10 next year. So say if we hire 12 this year at a lower rate, are, are we hiring more uh, to replace those who retire on top of these 12. And through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that is correct. So we are in the process of um, recruitment to in, in plan anticipation of those retirements. And my other question would be, um, in the long run, so if you have that lower salary and then replacing the retirees at lower salary, would that translate into maybe a possibly a tax reduction in the total? I'm not sure exactly how much difference there would be having um, more entry level firefighters as opposed to having entry level and uh, senior. Mr. Joyce. Thank you and through you. Um, the budgets already um, provide that uh, calculation so that's already taken into into account in the in the budget. So we plan for the retirements. We plan for probationary firefighters coming in at the lower wage scale. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, through you. <clears throat> First, I want to thank you to my colleagues. Uh, uh, giving us eye-opening uh, comments on it and very concerning comments on it. And thank you, uh, Councillor Shaves, for bringing this motion up. Um, as uh, some of my colleagues mentioned that uh, raising the tax is not a um, happy thing to do. Uh, as a responsible citizen and the public rep representative, is our responsibility to make sure the city and the citizen are in safe hand and they are safe, whether their lives or their, their property. This uh, motion is presenting particularly uh, that area, that $11 per month is kind of insurance to the Kingstonians' life and against their, their, their property, to protect their lives and, and their property. From last two years, I will speak my, my, for, for myself and for, for my family how I'm suffering. The grocery has been increased. I did not say anything. I'm living and buying it. Inflation rate is high. My income is not 
increased by the inflation. My mortgage on my house and my business has been increased average $2,200. Even I own a small business, I couldn't come up to increase my bottom line or the profit margin to make up that, but I am living, I'm paying. Every other thing, we, we saw all these slides today from the staff from the department, the 25 de department. Every department has increased their expenses. That's going to be a burden on the citizen. We did not say anything. We are happy to prove that because we understand the situation and the inflation and all the other issues. But this is something about the people's life and people's life saving. If something happened to me, to my family, I won't be able to buy another house next 20 years probably. What I have invested in my house to buying the house, it was my 30 years work saving. I work hard to save that money and buy the house I'm paying on it. That's asset for my children and from my, my grandchildren. $11 is will not bother me to protect my house. What happened if the insurance come forward and say, we're not gonna protect your house unless we increase your premium, the insurance premium by $11 a month? Am I gonna say no to cancel my insurance? No, I will be quiet and accept it. Maybe with the heavy heart, but I will accept it. So I understand and I want to address not only the staff, not only my colleagues, but all my fellow Kingstonians. Whatever we doing sitting here, that's for them, for their well-being, for their, their safety. This increase is, will not come to our pocket or will not benefit the mayor or the mayor's team or the city staff. This will benefit to my family, to my children. Saying that, I have the dashboard open here. Uh, what I'm saying, in last seven days, was 71 incident took place in Kingston. Average time response was five, point, five minute and one second probably. And the medical call was 25 call, the only the medical. Somebody got a heart attack and the emergency response was six minute and that person have only three minutes left. He lost his life. Then he might don't need the uh, any, any uh, for firefighter over there or ambulance over there uh, for, for any, any reason. He's gone. He doesn't care. And also the, my colleagues asked the question, uh, Councillor Amos, that when we upgraded our workforce, when we added more people 20 years ago, when I moved 20 years ago to the Kingston, it was a population I saw the first thing is 120,000 and that sign is still there, 120,000. 30 seconds. So concluding the, my, my comments, I have no issue to face the consequence and the criticism from my constituents and my fellow Kingstonian, but I will support this motion because it is the safety for the citizen. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else on round one? I think almost everybody has spoken. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? All right, yes, Councillor Osterhoff and then Councillor Shapes. All right, Councillor Shapes, go ahead. I'm not sure this is a sign, but for the last 10, 20 minutes, I've been watching lights flashing behind City Hall. So I'm not sure there was a fire engine there, but definitely there was an engine, there was an incident. Um, so just taken as a sign. Um, for exact numbers, if I could ask a question first, what is the salary between a top and firefighter, a top salary and a new recruit? Uh, Commissioner Joyce. Uh, it's approximately, I'm trying to go from memory here, around 45, 50,000 is the difference. Thank you. Um, I understand there would be fewer people losing their homes if their house caught fire, but it's not just their home. It's all their property as well. It's not often that someone who has their fire in the house is able to pack up everything and move and have their property and values. Um, 
and this affects the whole city. It's, it's not just the West End. Um, that, that is where the, the majority of the poverty growth has been. But if there are a no, number of calls in the West End, then those responses are coming from other areas in town, which then if there's a call in town or in the East End, it affects those responses as well. It takes 20 firefighters to staff a truck. That's what has been said at the last previous council. There are trucks at different stations where these individuals can be staffed. It allows for the new recruits to be trained and experienced by the time the new station is built. And if the new station is built ahead of schedule, then we have those staff personnel there and ready. But we, have that, we would have that extra staff, after extra truck for responses throughout for the whole city. And there's a difference between the older parts of the city and the newer parts of the city in regards to how the buildings are being built. In the West End, there's lighter timber than there is in downtown. They're also closer together. So they tend to burn faster and closer. And more houses are affected by one fire. It's not just one. It can be two or three. This a lot need, there's a need for more manpower and increased chance that the fire can be, the firefighters can get there quicker and helping to mitigate the fires. At the current time, they're more or less controlling the fire from spreading to another house than it is from controlling the actual house fire that they were called to. The initial call, the house is gone. I ask for your support in this. As for the citizens of this city, we need to increase public safety. It's been 20 years in the making. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, so a couple of things are coming clear to me here uh, as, as we're talking. Um, in some ways, I think this amendment um, is out of order. Mayor Patterson, we are not experts on fire response times. We are right out of our out of our expertise here. We have not received, as council, I have not heard from the deputy fire chief for the last six or eight years that we have a concern. No one's told us that. We don't know that for sure. We haven't done a study. We are, I would rather not do this and then crack open the budget by whatever vote we need and then open up the budget and say, we now have an informed professional study. We are just all over the map here. It is hearsay for me if, to hear that, oh, someone's going to die because we didn't get there. And I'm going to ask the question because we don't have a fire chief, we have an acting fire chief. But our decisions should be based on accurate information and analysis, not on hearsay. So, point of order. Point of order. This information has been shared before at the previous council when this report was put forward. The, the response times so, have increased. So, okay, that's not a point of order. That is a point of debate that you can raise in the next round of discussion. It's not a procedural problem. There's, there's no other issue there. Councillor Ostroff, you have the floor, and Councillor Shaves, you can respond to it after. Thank you. So I believe our arguments are flawed in the sense that I haven't seen a report. If we have had it completed, if, if the one from 2010 has, was implemented and completed in 2018, and we have a population increase and in all these concerns, then we should have started another study where we respond to, to that, and, and, and then, we, then, we're, then we're showing what's called good governance. What we're doing right now is reacting, and we're not, you know, everybody's going to want that. I, I'll vote for it, too, if that's really what I thought was good governance, but I don't think it is in this case. So as councillors, we should be given a report to respond to and informed and data and, 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 and a recommendation from staff. And since I have not seen that in, in, in any way that I'm aware of, I, will, I won't pass this because let's just work with what we know and then get this study done right away and we'll, we can, can, Mayor, um, can we not open um, the budget up again in 
June if we have a report saying there's a crisis? Or the CFO? Ms. Kennedy. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, the challenge is that we do have to set our tax rates and get our final tax bills out. So we would have to know what the budget is probably by the end of March to maybe the first week in April at the latest. If you were going to do something like that, Councillor, then I think what we would do is, is come back with a report um, and we would look at potentially funding some of it from the working fund reserve so that yes. it didn't impact the tax rate for 2023 yes. and, then, and then include it into the 2024 plans. That, to me, Mayor Patterson, is responsible governance there. That is how we ought to be proceeding forward. Um, and let's, let's take the data and the information that we know we have by an expert committee and our, our, our fire chief staff and staff and say this is a recommendation. So I, can't re I cannot support this amendment. I'd rather stick with our commitments right now and then let's have an accurate look at the situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Joyce, you wanted to, to respond? Yes, thank you, and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So fire station location study and response time optimiz optimization assessment was completed and uh, was um, provided to the ARC committee on June 23rd, 2022, and was subsequently presented to council on July 12th, 2022, last year. And in that report, it established uh, an optimized additional fire station and staffing at a location to reduce response time issues in the West End urban area. So that was one of the improvements noted in the report. Uh, Councillor Tozo. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Bohm, you're right. I have you next on my list. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, yeah, I was actually just going to make some of the comments that Commissioner Joyce just made, is that there, there was reports recommending it, as well as a, an accreditation um, study that actually looked at the need for it as well, and I believe that was actually part of the accreditation process, was to look at response times across the city. So I, I guess when, when I think about this entire thing is, you know what, as politicians, it sucks. It sucks that we have to raise taxes to provide services. There's never gonna be a fun tax. There's never be a, gonna be a good time to add a new tax. There's never be a good time to do anything other than 0% tax increases, which the city did years ago for many years. And then all of a sudden you get 12 and 15% tax increases as they're trying to catch up from the deficits they've created. We're still trying to catch up in, in roads and potholes. Just, just go for a drive around the city. That's what you get when you don't pay the money ahead of time. So thinking of that, it frustrates me to no end, and this is what I'm going to tell people. And <laughs> I'd love to share this with, with anybody and, and, and my fellow councillors as well, is when people call and they're frustrated about the tax rates in our city, or any city for that matter, direct them to the other levels of government. Because we have now for years had so much downloaded on us that to be honest, we're operating as city states. Our municipal governments have more responsibility now than they've ever had in the history of cities. And with that in mind, we have one of the simplest means of raising money, which is property taxes. And then we are at the whim and goodwill of the other levels of government to give us grants or funding, which usually has strings attached to it. And usually it ends after so many years. So here, take on the housing and homelessness portfolio. Here's $200 million for 10 years. Who knows what you get after that? You're on your own. So great, You're, and you have the no ability to say no. So that is what I constantly share with municipal taxpayers when they get frustrated, is that we are the lowest level of government and we keep getting more and more responsibility with fewer and fewer dollars. So what do we do? I mentioned it earlier, we go back and we starve our own resources. We are super excited. Hey, I'm all for density. I, I am super excited to add more to the downtown and everything like that, but there is a cost to that. We have to provide services. We have to provide more police, more ambulance, more fire, as we add more people to this city. The two stats that we just got sent by Commissioner Agnew to us basically should, in most people's mind, end this argument just by pure logic. A 33% increase in the population from in the last 20 years in Kingston Township. A 33% increase and, and no, no contributing increase uh, for services over there for fire and 16% overall in Kingston. And there hasn't been changes in 20 years. So our population grew great. Previous councils did a great job. We grew the city, but we kept going back to our own departments and starving them for that. So 
there's never going to be a great time to do this. It's going to be more expensive next year. Next year, what are our pressures going to be? Next year, what will be the challenges? Next year, what else are we going to have to consider putting off to do this? And then will we just bump this again? So with that in mind, and the fact that all the other comments that have come out tonight is, you know, it sucks. It truly does. But at the same time, it's going to suck not to do it. And we know the need is there. The reports speak to that. The accreditation speaks to that. And we've heard from residents that there's a concern. And, you know, we, we, we would be, be derelict in our duty if we didn't truly consider this and go, yeah, it's, it's an extra 0.7%. But I'm pretty sure if you look at that, there are many other things of far less import in our budget that we could go and strip out to make that up. So if we truly want to keep it at, you know, just under 3% or 3.2%, I'm sure there's other things we can push off. And, and maybe we can even ask that question to staff is, can we find this money somewhere or across the other departments to make up for this? Because I'm pretty sure when it comes to life and safety, as Councillor Hassan said, most people are going to put their family first and most people are going to demand that response from the city. That's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I'm agreeing a lot with what Councillor Bohm has said, so I'm a little worried. Um, <laughs> with all due respect to my friend, Councillor Bohm. Um, I, when I was knocking on doors during the election, it was my first campaign, and the number one thing I heard is, you politicians talk, talk, talk. You pontificate and you put it off. You talk, talk and you put it off, you never do anything. One guy looked at a pothole and he said, this pothole has been here forever. Just fix it. Well. We have a problem with our fire services. Just fix it. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. I want to make a couple of comments. First of all, this is a really good and a really important discussion. Right? I, I want to actually thank people on both sides of this. I think that our community needs to see that we are grappling with these issues. The other thing I'm gonna say is, we're not very far apart on this. Nobody around this table is suggesting we don't need more firefighters. Staff have recommended an additional 20 firefighters. Nobody's suggesting we don't need them. The issue is just simply in timing. How fast do we want to accelerate the hiring of those firefighters? And of course, that does come with a cost. And this is a cost that we're having to balance out. So I'll be the first one to say, do we need more firefighters? Absolutely. Do I think our firefighters do a great job? Absolutely. Do I think that we need to address response times? Absolutely. And I want to say thank you to them and to staff for putting together a plan that is actually recommending and building into our budgets more firefighters that are going to be hired. So I just, I think we should just perhaps uh, avoid statements like, you know, that, you know, that lives are at stake here when we all understand, of course, investment in emergency services is important. Of course it is. The problem is that there are some very unique circumstances this one year. That's why I raised this. This is the first time in 13 years that I have ever seen a 0.7% tax increase for homeless supports. We've never had that, ever. This is also the first time I can remember that the county of Frontenac has a 15% increase on the tax bill for ambulance services. I think we just need to recognize this. And I think it's unfortunate that these two big things are coming in the year where people are struggling more financially than they ever have before. To coin the words of Councillor Bohm, it sucks. Yes, it does. Councillor Bohm, thank you. I think you, you described it very, very well with that phrase. So when something sucks, then you've got to think about, okay, what is the best response? I don't think that either, response, either position that's being discussed around this table is invalid. I don't think either is irresponsible. If, it was, if one was irresponsible, then it would be a suggestion that the recommendation that, came, that staff have brought to us is irresponsible, and nobody around this table is suggesting 
that the, that the plan for hiring new firefighters that was put forward by staff is irresponsible and is going to put lives at risk. Nobody would say that. The only issue is, do we want to actually do a little bit more, right, and accelerate the plan that staff already had brought before us? So no matter how the vote comes tonight, I think it's just good that we've had this discussion, challenge each other's viewpoints, and I think when we leave this room, I hope that our community understands, A, fire service is really important and we need more of it, B, that we recognize and understand the cost of living pressures that people are under right now, and C, this is how we're gonna work it as a council. We're not gonna yell at each other and insult each other, right? Even when things get a little bit, you know, tense because we're dealing with tough issues, right? But ultimately that by deliberating together, we can make the right decision. Thank you. Return the chair. Thank you. Next is Councillor Sanek and then Councillor Clay. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have one question for CFO Kennedy. And uh, at the beginning of our conversation, I think you said that if we do this increase with the firefighters, it works out to be, on average, for like an average bill, an extra $11. Was that it? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, that's correct. On an average household, it would be an extra $11 on the tax bill. Thank you for confirming that. Um, so if we don't want to talk about response times, then another reason to hire these um, firefighters this year is because of knowledge transfer. As we know, some we have quite a few um, firefighters that are going to be turning 60 in the next two years or so, and that's mandatory retirement. And this gives extra time then um, to teach the young firefighters, you know, everything that needs to be done so we don't have a big, not just response gap, but a big knowledge gap. And so to me, succession planning is really important and I want the new firefighters to get up to speed um, as soon as possible. Also, like we're trying to encourage more people to be green and, you know, when they put um, solar panels on the roof, you know, like the, the firefighters, if one of those houses catches on fire, it takes extra time for the firefighters to, uh, they have to turn off the roof. Um, Councillor Oserhoff probably knows all about that to de-electrify, and that takes knowledge transfer as well. And um, again, it goes back to the safety of it. And um, my last point then is, yeah, we did have um, a report at Arts Recreation Community Policy back in June, but we also had a report four days before Christmas, right, back on December 20th. And I know that um, Councillor Shaves, like, tried to um, do an amendment, you know, to try to defer it, you know, back to committee so we could discuss the report some more, but we didn't. So here we are tonight, you know, debating this, and um, I still support uh, going ahead with this. Um, in that report on December 20th, it did acknowledge that the number of firefighters for response has not increased since 2003, and we just saw the population figures right now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, I, I have a couple of questions that I'm going to pose. Um, I've experienced a house fire, so I understand this on a very personal level, standing on the street, watching everything burn. Um, it's horrific, having to recover computer files that took months to do. So I do understand the destruction that it causes. I also understand the stress that not being able to um, put food on the table causes. So we're talking about competing needs. So I think we need to get... Um, a bit better handle on what we're actually uh, moving forward with. So um, I'm going to ask, please remind council what the original plan was to build up the complement as compared to what's being asked, because I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to come to a middle ground. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. So the original plan called for in year 2024 to hire eight additional firefighters, in 2025 to hire four, uh, uh, an additional four, same thing in year 2026, and same thing in year 2027. So bringing the total complement additional firefighters to 20. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so I would like to see if we could propose a friendly amendment to the amendment. Um, <laughs> and that, because I, I do believe we're proposing 12, right? Which is a rather large ask. Um, and we're trying to balance um, multiple priorities here. So I'm recognizing that we've got um, a number of things to balance off. And I do want to show the community that we are responsive and concerned about this. But I also want to show the rest of the community who are worried about being able to pay their taxes, uh, keep their homes, and put food on the table, that we have their interests at heart as well. So um, I'm going to ask that uh, my understanding is that we have to hire in complements of four. Is that correct? Commissioner Joyce? Through you, yes, that's correct. OK. Um, so what would be the cost for eight and four, then, just so we're clear? So I'm just, I'm just going to pause for a minute. Um, I'm always hesitant about putting staff on the spot if we just need to make sure we check our numbers. I mean, if it's a simple back of the envelope calculation, that's fine. If staff would like some time to work something out, we should be taking a break at some point. So I just want to offer that. Commissioner Joyce, are you okay to answer that at this point? I can for 2023. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if we were to hire eight firefighters, the impact on the budget would be 493,300. Okay. And I'm assuming half of that if we're going to do four. That is correct. Okay. And what would the impact on our taxes be? Can we get a number on that? What would it put our rate up to? Ms. Kennedy's just doing a, a little math work. <laughs> I'm happy to take a bio break if they want a minute. <laughs> Sorry, just to confirm for eight instead of 12? Yep. Could, could we have the numbers for four and eight so we actually can, can consider it? So it would be roughly per household, it would be roughly around four for the four and eight for the eight because it's 11 in total. Sorry. So basically two, two thirds okay. of the 740 cost for eight and one third the cost for four. So you break it into thirds. Is that that's fair? Okay. okay. Um, so I'm going to propose that we move forward with putting four more and that we accelerate, we look to accelerate our plan. So, um, so, so can you just, just give me one minute? Okay. Madam Acting Clerk, can I see you for a moment? Okay, so there is a motion to amend the amendment that would change the number of new firefighters for 2023 hired from 12 to four. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Hassan. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and give uh, staff a chance to kind of just write that up, make sure everyone knows what we're at, and then we'll reconvene at 8.53. Thank you. 
Okay, folks, it is uh, 8.54. I'm going to ask if people can um, grab their seats. We're going to reconvene. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Rich? Can I just commence? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah until, until the mover of the amendment comes back in the room. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're going to reconvene. So we have a motion to amend the amendment. It's put forward by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Hassan. Uh, if I can see that up on the screen, please. I'm just going to uh, treat it. Okay. So moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that the motion uh, to amend, moved by Councillor Shaves and seconded by Councillor Senate, be amended to delete the number 740,000 and replace it with 250,000 and to delete 12 firefighters and replace it with four firefighters. Oh my gosh, four firefighters, so that it reads as follows, that the 2023 municipal operating budget for transportation, public works, Kingston Fire and Rescue be increased by $250,000 to facilitate the hiring of four additional firefighters in 2023. And is there, is there another section beyond that? Okay, did, okay, okay, hold on. So my understanding is that the, the amendment that Councillor Glenn and I discussed was a little bit different from this. Is that right? Can I just get a? Sorry, I'm going to need a sidebar with the CAO just for. Could you just take a two minute recess? Okay, folks, uh, take two. Uh, now I think we are ready to reconvene. Uh, so thanks, thanks for your patience, everybody. So 
Um, if I can just get people to just grab their seats. Okay, so here is the motion to amend the amendment moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Sun, that the motion to amend moved by Councillor Shaves and seconded by Councillor Sanic be amended to delete the number 740,000 and replace it with 500,000 and to delete 12 firefighters and replace it with eight firefighters, it being understood that $250,000 is to be funded through the working fund reserve. Okay, so that is the motion to amend the amendment that is on the floor. Councillor Glenn, uh, you, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I've heard both sides of this, and I see all of us being torn, being swayed one way or another. I think that this accelerates what was an original plan to increase the complement of firefighters by a year. And I'm happy for us to go back as a council and have a look at what else we need to do. But I think that this is a reasonable start. Um, it hits the tax base minimally, but at the same time gets us further to where we need to be in terms of increasing the response rates and ensuring that we're taking care of uh, the community in this regard. So I think that this is a reasonable step forward. Um, I heard you know, the, the concerns about threats to life, threats to property, and I took those seriously. But I also heard the concerns about we're questioning what was brought forward to us um, which I really hope um, was brought forward to us in good faith and with the best interest of the community at heart from the original plan. So if that's not the case, then um, we're questioning the reports that come before us and they should have been questioned when they hit the floor then. So I am going to say that as we move forward as a council, um, that we actually really reach out and make sure that we are getting the full picture because to come to budget and have to make these decisions um, on the fly, I don't think is appropriate. So these questions need to be asked a lot sooner. I understand we're a new council um, in large part, but we should be coming to budget with a fuller picture of what the actual need is because what's hitting the floor right now is we've got another crisis, um, but that wasn't expressed anywhere. So I think that this is a reasonable ground forward. I think it accelerates what was already in place and gets us closer to where we need to be, and hopefully uh, gets us to some agreement around this horseshoe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? Yeah, and take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. So I want to thank Councillor Glenn for putting this forward. I think that this is a compromise, and I understand when you do a compromise, not everybody gets everything that they want, but I think it's a good way of expressing the two sides of this discussion. And to be honest, it gets everybody most of the way. What I mean by that is that by funding only four firefighters through, uh, through property tax, now the property tax increase, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Ms. Ms. Kennedy, the, the, pro the property tax increase now would be 0.1, which is much smaller rather than 0.3, 0 0.1% tax increase, and by funding an additional four through the working fund reserve, we're getting eight of 12. So just, if you can appreciate both sides of this discussion, I just hope that you can see the value of this, this amendment. I think it's a good middle ground. You know what, sure, we can play for keeps and try to you know, stake out our ground, but I think that this is a good moment for us to be able to show our community that we can also understand that, okay, if both of these things are a priority, we can find a space in the middle. So I do hope that council will, will support this. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, if I could just have the, the chair. Oh. Yeah, I return it back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next is Councillor Shapes. Thank you. Um, basically, two points. So we're going from $11 per to increase in tax to eight. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. No, we are going from 11 to, with the working fund contribution, to about three. So could we use a working fund contribution for the 12? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and <clears throat> through you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm not sure if all of council has seen the proposed amendment. Um, if, if not, it might be helpful to put it on the screen. 
but I think what the proposed amendment is is to go from 12 to 8 firefighters in 2023. That represents a cost of about 500,000 instead of 740. And the potential here is to finance 250,000 of that 500 from the working fund reserve this year. Therefore, the impact on the tax base for this year would be 250,000, which would result in 0.1% approximately. Um, to your question, uh, Councillor Shaves, we, we could look at funding more from the working fund reserve. I just want to make sure Council understands that working fund reserve is a one-time funding source only, and eventually it has to be absorbed in the tax base. So if we're not dealing with the 740 this year because we're using working fund reserve, that funding source is gone next year, and that would be an additional 740 to next year's tax base plus the other eight that are already planned next year. So the firefighter budget next year would be pretty significant. Councilor Shapes? Uh, but it, it can be done. So it doesn't matter if we get the eight, that's going to contribute to next year's tax rate anyways, because it can't be the working fund, correct? Uh, CEO Hurdle. Thank you, Andrew. So council can do whatever council would like to do. There's no question about that. But ultimately, what you would be seeing is an impact of the cost of 16 firefighters on next year's tax rate because the working fund reserve would only fund you for a year. It's, a, there, it's used for one-time funding. It cannot provide ongoing funding. So the cost would need to be absorbed through the tax rate at some point in the future year. So I'm just gonna jump in procedurally. So our procedural bylaw does not allow an amendment to an amendment to an amendment. So, um, so you either have to support the amendment to the amendment or vote down the amendment to the amendment and put another amendment to the amendment. Does that, does everyone understand what I just said? Does that make sense? It's pretty confusing. But just so you know, this, we're at the limit that we basically can't further amend what's on the floor now. It's either gonna have to be a yes or no vote at this point. Council so, Shapes. So my understanding is it takes a minimum of eight firefighters to man a truck. Or 12, sorry. Uh, Commissioner Joyce. Uh, that is correct, yes. So hiring eight, eight firefighters would not do anything to response times or anything. Is that correct? Hiring Joyce? the eight, through you, your worship, hiring the eight would um, provide a little more flexibility with our staffing uh, that we have. It would not permit us to actually get another uh, truck on the floor and out the door for that. We do require three firefighters on the truck, uh, but it would help with our overtime and um, our flexibility in terms of, of staffing. Okay, so my initial motion was to put, have the capability of putting a truck on the road in order to decrease the response times and increase public safety, which originally was $11 per month, per year for an average household. For those who make, whose house, houses are lower cost would pay less, and those homes who are most, more expensive would pay more. We're roughly talking a dollar, less than a dollar a month or, or even less than a coffee a month. Okay, anybody else on the amendment to the amendment? Councillor Stephen. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor McLaren is next on my list, and I'll come to Councillor Stephen. Councillor McLaren. Thank you, so this is definitely an acceleration, we can see that. Um, with, the ex with the extra flexibility, um, would this allow for, um, say on the, um, the most um, extreme cases, such as when there's people who are off on holidays or during um, special, events when people can't get to work to have that flexibility would that be able to um, provide more coverage than not doing this commissioner joyce thank you and through you yes it would so in the worst case say there's a snowstorm firefighters can't get to work but we do have more to draw from it's more likely that there will be the ability to provide the, the full service that we have now 
um, and or if there's a holiday, a long weekend or something like that, it allows for a less of a decrease in capacity. Would that be true as well? So generally what, would it, what it would do is reduce the uh, requirement for call-ins for overtime. I mean, we obviously try to maintain the service levels at all time and, and Kingston Fire and Rescue has been um, quite successful with that over the last few years, even particularly in, uh, through the pandemic. They've done an amazing job and I think that's a lot due to the commitment of the firefighters. Um, so it would reduce the level of overtime that would be required to uh, compensate or deal with those kind of uh, vacancies that can occur. Thank you. Another concern that was raised was knowledge transfer. If we do hire eight, um, it seems to me that um, we start the knowledge transfer. Um, that We don't need 20 or 12 for knowledge transfer, do we? Commissioner Joyce? Thank you, and through you, this is a, it's it's kind of an odd um, an odd scenario to look at. We, you know, when you when you look at the organization as a whole and what we have, I'm not as concerned about the knowledge uh, transfer. The firefighters are the Kingston Fire and Rescue is, is a very find force and that's how they were able to achieve the accreditation that they achieved. Um, every year you're going to lose uh, senior officers and senior firefighters and that knowledge does go out the door. Um, but a lot of that knowledge always continues to be transferred as well from existing, uh, the existing fire personnel. So I wouldn't want to try to, uh, you know, portray the fire service in such a way that we feel that um, if we lose, uh, you know, a, a few firefighters, that that loss of knowledge is going to have a, a, some some major impact in terms of life safety. Because I, I don't believe that to be the truth. Thank you. I think that this um, this amendment allows for a much sweeter spot between um, helping people uh, saving lives, having uh, response times, transferring <coughs> knowledge, even that, and reducing the harm done to people who are on the margins and um, having trouble paying their tax bills. And in that sense, that's what a compromise does. It finds a better place to come to uh, that affects better, more people. And I think that this is, in fact, a better balance between all the competing um, issues that have been brought up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I so appreciate all the comments and thoughts that have come forward. Financially, this compromise makes absolute sense. I saw it and I thought, that's it. That's, that's what we do. Operationally, I have a wonder, though, about the difference between 8 and 12. And I think Councillor Shaves and Commissioner Joyce talked about it a bit, but part of the compromise is financial, but part of it is operational. So if we compromise on operational, are we in fact really doing much of anything? And I don't have the answer to that, but I just wanted to put that out there. I'm still thinking on this. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, Councillor Stephen, was that a question to staff or that was a question for us all to think about? Is that we? Oh, it was a rhetorical. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry, I missed that. Okay. okay, is there anybody else, anybody else who wishes to speak to the amendment to the amendment? Councillor Bolt. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, obviously uh, adding money from the Working Fund Reserve uh, definitely changes the conversation a bit. I'm just curious if staff could quickly answer, if we were to vote down this amendment and take that $250,000 from this, and amend the original amendment from Councillor Shaves, how much would that be looking at for our tax increase overall then? We had 0.3%, or sorry, yeah, it was 0.3%. If we were to do that, what would this be adding? Essentially use the 250,000 on the original 12. Commissioner Joyce. <laughs> so the the impact would be um, just under five hundred thousand um, dollars, 
um, to help out. So uh, that would equate to, I believe, uh, around 0.2%. 0.2%. Okay, and uh, and with that, uh, actually, Commissioner Joyce, is a question for you. If uh, if money grew on trees, and uh, recognizing that, you know, I believe there was a comment earlier saying, you know, like staff have brought this forward to us, and and we have to go with what you know what they recommend, which which is obviously ideal, but also recognizing that you know you're put in a tough spot because you know previous council and and you had to go on what what was recommended there gives targets of two and a half percent. Um, so when you're trying to do your budgeting and everything like that, you're trying to keep your, your your target at that. So is if money were no object and you had to choose between eight and 12, what would be the ideal number to actually reduce the concern about response times across the city? So uh, it would be 12 because that would put the additional truck on the road for response. Okay, thank you. So so with, with that being said, I mean, I, I guess in a sense, I, I completely understand where the amendment to the amendment comes from. It's in an attempt to, I guess, you know, recognize on one hand, you know, the costs that we're battling with, which I'm still going to point out, I'm going to continue to do this. I've did this the last few councils I've been on as well is, is so much of these pressures are put on us, but by the inaction of the upper levels of government. And that's why our meetings go so long, because we're constantly trying to create stopgap measures to deal with things that they're not properly funding. And they love to download on us and, and leave us here to debate these things all night. But the problem is, is that this is a municipally funded service. And so at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's it's politics in a sense to say that, you know, eight solves somewhat of a problem or meets halfway, because it really doesn't, by the sound of it, it doesn't add that other truck. And I mean, to, to some of the concerns of the West End residents and, and residents across the city, is this adds and brings forward a lot of costs, but doesn't really offer the solutions that that 12 would. So in a sense, it is kind of do one or the other. Do, doing this midway thing doesn't really actually solve anything. It, it increases our costs. I would say I'd actually be more in favor of doing nothing than doing the eight. It's kind of like either 12 or zero because the eight brings forward a lot of costs, but to very little benefit. And so in my mind, I don't think I can support the amendment to the amendment because of that. Um, I, re I recognize the rationale behind it. It's to try to soften the blow, but, but your net gain is just not there. You're, you're not getting that extra truck, which is really what this whole debate is about. I mean, we could go 7, 11, 8, 9, 6, but if you're not at that 12 number, you're not getting that truck. So it's kind of like, what's the point in doing it at all then? So that's uh, that's why I won't be supporting this. And uh, I will be likely looking for maybe the mover of the amendment to propose some money from the Working Fund Reserve on his original amendment, but uh, to soften the blow that way, perhaps. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Tozo and then Councillor Rich. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Through you, um, <clears throat> yeah. I can I just ask staff a question? And hypothetically, if we do pull from the working fund for twelve firefighters, what would that cost difference be between the eight and the twelve? I don't know if you answered this. It's getting late, and I was up with my kids last night. CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through. So we we have been running multiple scenarios and numbers <laughs> in the background. <laughs> Um, so if council wanted to uh, to remain at 12 uh, firefighters at the cost of 740, um, one, what could be done is we could increase the um, funding from the working fund reserve. So let's say we increased it to 340,000. That would leave an impact on the tax, property tax of 400,000 for um, 2023. Uh, that would be less than 0.2%. So not quite 0.2%. Okay. So you could proceed in that direction if that's something you'd like to do. We're just providing you options. So thank, thank you, CA O'Hurdle. Um, I hope the clerks wrote that. that, that so, no. so again, so, yeah. so that's fine. You, these questions are in order, but again, there is no opportunity to amend what's already on the floor. No, what's we have on to the vote. floor now has to be a yes or no. So, and we have to vote this down if we want to add another for That's another right. Is that correct? That's right. Your worship? Okay. Right. Um, so I, I would probably 
hope that you wrote the, the clerks down. If we do vote against this amendment, I'm going to propose that amendment. So then we'll just have an amendment on an amendment. So is that correct? Where are we? So if council votes down this, this. amendment to the amendment, yeah. then another amendment to the amendment would be in order. Okay. Um, that to me is the ideal compromise to this. It doesn't increase the tax base. We get the 12, we get an extra truck on the road. We actually affect service levels um, and it doesn't impact our taxes as much. Uh, I am encouraging my fellow councillors to vote down this amendment. We'll propose an amendment to the amendment and hopefully that will minimize the tax burden and that's, we can get the 12 on the road and everyone can be happier with this. Um, that's my position on this. Thank you. Councilor Rich. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I must uh, repeat Councilor Tozo's amazement at my ability to agree with Councilor Bohm so frequently in this debate. Um, I, I, have, I just have a brief point. I, I'm not voting, and I'm going to vote no for this amendment to the amendment and then we'll see how many times we can say amendment this evening. Um, I just wanted to bring up a point about uh, what the, the, you said, Your Worship, about compromise. Uh, there, is a, there is an indirect intention for this amendment, which is to improve service levels. And it's been, I, it's been proven to my satisfaction that uh, just having the eight as a complement for this will not do so based on the many, many questions that have been directed at staff, and staff have been amazing, by the way, handling that. Um, so the issue with compromise on a file like this is that uh, when you do it all the time, things fall apart. And it's pretty clear that what we've seen over the last 20 years has been compromise after compromise after compromise on this particular file in terms of coverage for particular parts of the city. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't agree with this amendment to the amendment, and I will not be voting in favor of it. Thank you very much. Okay, is there anybody else on the amendment to the amendment? Councillor Glenn? Um, I wanted to have a last um, moment to address this, because I think, again, we came into this without a full picture. So when the 12 was proposed, Nobody said, we need 12 for a truck. So I'm going to urge again <laughs> that we get the full picture on things. So I can see where the vote's gonna go and I'm okay with it. But um, it's very difficult to come up with a solution when we're not getting all that information. And then my question is, going back to the original proposal that was going to put eight new firefighters forward next year, why were only eight recommended? if we knew it was not going to address the issue. So in my mind, we're not being given the correct information we need to actually change the situation out there. And that really frustrates me. Um, we rely on everyone um, in the various departments and organizations that we fund to give us the full picture. And maybe that picture isn't something that we like to hear, we want to hear, but if we don't get that full picture, it makes making these decisions really difficult. Um, I'm sitting here trying to bring, you know, a reasonable solution to the table without knowing that basic fact that we need 12 for a truck. So um, I'm gonna, you know, end it there, let the vote move forward, and let's see if we can get to a resolution on this file. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? Take the chair and recognize you. So can I just ask staff, um, would additional eight firefighters be helpful? Three, yes, they would be. Okay, I, I, just, I just think that that needs to be made. Somehow we've gone to the fact that anything less than 12 suddenly does nothing. And, and I just think that that's just not fair, and that's very clear what staff have just told us. And is that why staff in their original plan recommended an eight and then a four and a four? I mean, presumably that was thought into it that you know if the original staff plan was to add eight next year, that adding eight this year would also be productive. Is that, Commissioner Joyce, am I on the right track there? Can you just- That is council? correct. 
Okay, well, I think everyone can decide how they want to vote, but I just think that, again, I actually think that the amendment to the amendment was actually a very good compromise and actually does very much help financially and operationally. My two cents. Thank you. Yeah, I won't forget to give you the chair back. I give it back. Thank you. Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Glenn, for uh, bringing the comments um, about this amendment. And I do recognize the uh, knowledge and the ability to um, see the situation uh, the council from Councillor Bohm and uh, Paul, the Councillor Shave, and my other colleagues. And we brought this amendment for the same reason that we want to get into the middle ground by looking at the original proposal in, in the budget. Nothing this year, but eight next year. And to my understanding, when I see that one, I thought this program is over uh, four years or for five years extended to complete the 20. Um, uh, the 20 firefighter to the uh, rescue team. So I was thinking that we can move f uh, forward faster year before, or in, in, in two years instead, four years or for five years. So that's why we proposed this amendment. And again, um, I respect to the all, all colleagues for the, their comments and their concern. Um, more money from the working um, funds, I think, is again, is a burden going to go back to the um, uh, citizen anyway, either this year or next year or year after. The people has to pay pay for it anyway. But going easy, I think that's the best proposal. We um, I second it, and I will still stay with my decision that. Uh, if, if that can we move forward, that will resolve all the issues. Otherwise, I'm okay with however the results come out. You know, like we are all for, for the Kingston thinking the same way. Okay, uh, Councillor Ostroff. I, th I think Councillor Hassan is right. Uh, we should just um, support this amendment at this time to close it, and we've done better. We're, we're making headway. Uh, I, uh, I, I do appreciate Councillor Glenn's uh, frustration because we, we are in the kitchen and, and looking at the pots and pans when we don't belong there. That we're supposed to take it from our staff. They work for us or however that works respectfully. You know, they work and they are experts and they have the knowledge and the data. We are just playing in the kitchen and making a mess. So we should stop in my opinion. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any other hands, so I will call the vote on the motion to amend the amendment. Everyone's clear on what's on the table? Okay, all those in favor? Five? Opposed? Eight. Mayor Patterson, Councillor Osterhoff, Councillor McLaren, Councillor Hassan, Councillor Glenn um, were in the minority. The amendment to the amendment has failed. Now we are back to the original um, motion to amend. Um, so Councillor Glenn, you had the floor. So I'll move on. Is there uh, anybody else who wishes to speak to the motion to amend? So we're back to the original 12 firefighters. Yes, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I have an amendment to the amendment. Mm -hmm. And if that could be put on the screen. I think this gets us closer to the intention of this, and... Um, okay, yeah. so we have a new motion to amend the amendment, moved by Councillor Tozo, second by Councillor Amos, that the motion to amend, moved by Councillor Shaves, and second by Councillor Sanic, the amended to add the following thereto, it being understood that 340,000 is to be funded through the Working Fund Reserve, and 400,000 is to be funded by taxation for an increase of less than 0.2%. Councillor Tozo, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I think this gets us to where we need to be. It lowers the impact on our overall tax rate. It gets no, another fire truck on the road. Uh, we get the 12, and firefighters can actually service that, and we can sort of resolve this issue. Uh, I would encourage council with the added information um, to answer this. And, uh, you know, I would say that we're politicians. We're here to make decisions. I'm here, I wanna fix these problems. We're hearing from staff and that we have a, a problem with our fire service in the city. Let's fix it. This fixes it and it minimizes the burden on our taxpayers. I think this gets us there. So please, I encourage you to support this amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Glenn. 
I'm going to support the amendment um, because I think we need to move this forward and I do think we need to um, improve the fire service. But I just want everybody to be aware that if we continue to um, add more and more, what we're going to see is death by a thousand cuts here. Um, the tax burden isn't something to be ignored. I understand that we wanna do fabulous things here. I have a lot of things on my wish list that I'd like to bring forward for the city. But I also recognize that if I'm not cautious with how and when those things come forward, um, that I'm going to hurt somebody along the way. And so I'm going to urge you that as we move forward in the next couple of years to look at your wish list and make sure that you're making good choices also on this other side of it. Um, we've got necessary things we have to do. This is a have to do. So that may mean if we're going to ensure that people aren't losing their homes, we've seen an unprecedented rise in mortgages, in food, in basic costs. So that's what I'm going to put out to this council. I'm happy to do this um, because I do think it's a necessary thing. But please, as we move forward with other things we're going to do in the city, be cautious about what you ask for because the burden will come back to the people who can very least afford it in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, again. Um, I'm echoing the uh, Councillor Glenn's comment. Uh, I have no problem uh, moving forward with <laughs> and supporting this amendment because originally uh, my uh, comments about the um, original motion, I'm, I'm still also re recognize that. But it is very important for all 12 of us. To, we are the politician. We are going to help the people, and, but on the behalf of the people. The people's money is also our responsibility. We have to look at the responsible way. We want to do so many good things, as Councillor Glenn, Glenn said. Uh, every one of us has the wish list to make the Kingston a better place, uh, and place where everyone can enjoy and afford to live. But also, it's all about the money. We have to manage that money uh, differently. We, we should think ahead of time then how is it going to impact the both sides, the people who is paying and the people who is getting benefit out of it. Once again, I urge this, the same with the, uh, Councillor Glenn and Councillor McLaren and uh, Councillor Ustroff, they've been commenting about it. We have to be responsible, but this time just moving forward to get over with it and help the, uh, our firefighters and increase the security and safety for our, our citizens and for ourselves and for our family as well, I will be happy to uh, vote in the favor of this. Thank you, Councillor Boehm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I just wanna thank everybody for uh, a great uh, debate, great back and forth, uh, great points on both sides, um, especially with uh, you know the responsibility towards fiscal restraint in, in, in our city. And, and with that, I just want to add a couple comments. I, I'm going to support the amendment, obviously. And when it when it comes to the burden on the taxpayers, just keep in the back of of your mind, if you will. You know, there are ways that that we can help this. So, you know, thanks to staff and and everybody for you know helping with the working fund reserve contribution, uh, recognizing that that's there as a one time tool only. So then we need to look to the future. And, and we know that, you know, we saw the 16% the, the overall increase in, in our population, which, which created this pressure, in, in a sense, if you will. So with that in mind, there's ways that we can help reduce the burden on, you know, residential taxpayers going forward in the future. So when the votes come up in the future, you know, cast your mind back to, to this debate tonight and 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 how how we got here. And so the way we got here is, you know, by... We have such a pressure on, on our fiscal systems right now. So how can we alleviate those pressures? How can we plan for that? Well, growing and expanding our business parks in the city, bringing more businesses here so they pay more taxes and create more jobs and create more taxpayers because obviously we know that a bigger uh, bigger pool of taxpayers lightens the load overall across the city. So, Councilman, I'm only going to interject just because I just want to make sure you're speaking to the 
amendment sure. to the amendment? Right. So how do we afford the amendment to the amendment <laughs> going forward? I'll make my final point there, and then and then I'll close. I'll close up. So uh, and also, you know, we know that the West End uh, needs, you know, the services because the 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 growth out there, the sprawl, if you will. So increasing the density downtown as we move forward is going to help alleviate this burden on the taxpayers and by adding more taxpayers. So with that, I hope everybody can support the amendment to the amendment and and this passes. Thank you. Okay, anybody else on the uh, amendment to the amendment? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so now we are, um, I'm conf yeah, so now we are on, sorry. Now we're on the amendment as amended. Okay, is there any discussion on the amendment as amended? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by a vote of 11 to two, Councillor Ostroff and uh, myself opposed. Okay, so now we are back to the budget as amended. Any further discussion on the budget? Deputy Mayor Chinani. I have an amendment also. Okay, <laughs> here we go. We can put that up on the screen. Okay, so a motion to amend moved by Deputy Mayor Chinani, second by Councillor Tozo, that the 2023 municipal capital budget for transportation and public works engineering department be increased by $3 million to facilitate additional road rehabilitation to be funded from the municipal capital reserve fund. Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'll just be brief. Um, I just think we can try to get ahead on our road maintenance to try to save costs later. Um, as uh, Councillor Amo said, some of our, our roads are tired looking. Um, and I, I think it'll just hopefully give a, because we're just doing the bare minimum that we could do. So if we could just do a little bit extra and without, this doesn't increase taxes. So, and it, it'll eventually need to be done anyway. So I, f I figure if we can get a little head start on, on, uh, on some things that uh, some people will be very happy, especially since this is probably one of the biggest things we've heard of out of all the districts, uh, at the door. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Dip. Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. I'm happy to support this amendment. These are the sorts of amendments that, that I'm okay with because we are shifting dollars around, in this case from reserve funds, it's not affecting the property tax rate. Um, so I, I will support this amendment. Thank you. I return the chair. Councilor Tozo. Thank you and I will be your worship through you and I'll be brief. I look forward to this. I was very happy to second this amendment. Uh, I'm looking forward to being a pothole politician for once. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, thank you, Councillor Sinang, for uh, bringing this forward. Uh, I, a, a number of things I heard at the door um, and I reiterated to staff last night or two nights ago, uh, like I said, it was last night, the, um, my district is in grave need of repair, so I'm hoping some of this $3 million will be allocated to my district, uh, but also be shared throughout the other districts as well. Just, I will support this motion. Thank you. Councilor Shaves. I look forward to supporting this motion as well. Traveling from the West End to downtown, coming into several meetings now, more frequently. Um, I've, I've seen the tired roads and maybe more than tired. And I do think if we do get ahead of this, it does help the, the citizens as well. Not just not increasing taxes, but decreasing the potential of car repairs from rims or axles or just normal wear and tear that gets increased by our tired roads. Thank you. Okay. So it is almost 9.40. Um, everyone is welcome to speak, but if you think that an amendment is likely to pass, 
Um, I encourage, I mean, if you have something new you want to add, by all means, but I've just, because there might be some more that we have to deal with, and I'm just sensitive to the fact that it's been three long days. But that being said, Councilor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to say, me too. <laughs> I also want to see more roads be repaired, especially in Collins Bay Ridge District. But uh, so I do have a question for staff. So um, Commissioner Joyce, you always give us a road list with all the roads that are in the plan um, to be, you know, done this this year, and also the local roads, right? So engineering, and then also public works. So with this additional money, I know you are going to give us the road list by the end of this week, um, like could we have the road list by April, you think? Or how long do you think it'll take for us to get the road list? Commissioner Joyce? Thank you and through you, Your Worship. Uh, so I think we could have that list to you by the end of the week with if this uh, amendment goes forward and gets changed, we can still um, figure out what that would mean. Okay, uh, Councillor Glenn. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm happy to support this, um, uh, especially given that we're going to put a new fire truck on the road. I think um, it'll keep it in better repair. Um, so ho hopefully we'll get a few savings there. Um, but my quick question is, we're pulling a lot on reserve funds, so I just want to know um, what situation that puts us in with reserve funds so that we make sure we have reserves for um, crisis or emergency. Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, through Mr. Mayor. Yes, there's no problem at all with that. That's coming out of our municipal capital reserve fund, um, which is the one we normally use for roads. So we've been able to factor it into the models without any problem. Councillor Hassan. A uh, quick question to uh, CFO. Um, now we have uh, money for the road, uh, repair the roads, and now we have a new truck. Also, we have uh, road safety and traffic calming issues too. Uh, how I can request half a million or a million dollar more added to the capital reserve fund from the to review the, the traffic calming issues or so, just to help the uh, bring the so, traffic so calming down. So Councillor Son, so that that actually would be out of order. That you would be talking about a separate amendment. So this is if you wanted to change the amount on this amendment, that would be an that would be in order, or if you wanted to change the way it was financed. But if you're talking about money for something else, that would have to be treated as a separate amendment. So that's the only reason why you can say it, but you, you can ask that question, but let's wait till we get back to the budget rather than dealing with the amendment. Does that make sense? So I just want to make sure people are speaking only to the amendment in front I of us. I don't understand. So if is a possibility to request more money into this uh, amendment for traffic calming, or is it has to be separate? No, because this amendment isn't for traffic Just calming. For, okay. This this is for road rehabilitation. So if you wanted more money for traffic calming, then you would have to bring forward another amendment. So can you can't, you can't amend this one? Okay. So right. can can I do that, Ms. Uh, Ms. Clark, to request for money for the traffic so, calming? Right, but, but we can't do it right now because right now we've got the, this one motion to amend on the floor. Anybody else on the motion to amend that is in front of us? Okay, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councilor McLaren. Thank you. I would also like to move an amendment to the budget. This is based, uh, this is going to be put on the, there, thank you. It's for um, additional traffic uh, crossing guards. One of the things that I did hear a lot of uh, in my district, there's, five, there's four schools, and two of them feel that the changes in behavior that people are driving their kids to school um, necessitates the possibility or the need for more traffic um, guards. Um, so having talked to staff, apparently the maximum capacity that they can take at this moment is four. And we're leaving it professionalized for them to decide which schools need it the most. Um, this is uh, essentially to try and alleviate some of the pressures that principals have been talking to me about in my district and perhaps in other districts as well. Point, point of order? Yeah, so I'm just, I'm just going to pause right there. So, um, so this is a motion to amend moved by Councilor McLaren. In order, for, in order for us to move further, there needs to be a seconder. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councilor Song. Okay. okay, so now it's been duly moved and seconded. So Councilor McLaren, you can continue if there's anything else you wanted to share. I think I'll just answer any questions if there are any. 
Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Is this just generally we're adding more traffic, more crossing guards in for the city, or and then staff will decide where they go? Commissioner Joyce? Yes, through you, Your Worship, that's correct. Okay, I'm good. Thanks. Uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Okay. Well, everyone knows what I'm going to ask. Right? Our property tax increase may be low, but it's not as low as it was. So I'm going to ask, um, what would be the property tax increase to this amendment? Ms. Kennedy? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So this amendment would be about a 0.03% tax increase. Okay, so a relatively small amount, 0 0.03. Okay, thank you. I return the chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to follow up on the mayor's question. Is this funding, like to fund this amendment, uh, will that be coming from property taxes or is that already baked into the budget somewhere else? Ms. Kennedy. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, it would be coming from property taxes. So it would be an additional 0.03% to the property tax, be about $1 per household. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, um, I want to support this, because I, but I, I think that for me, I think about all the work we're doing in our school safety zones, and there's great work being done, and I'd like to have their feedback on it. I just don't know if this is the time. We're going to have strategic plan, you know. Then we can, then we can bring before our, all our concerns and what we would like to see in our districts. I don't think it's. I, I don't. I've never seen this before, so I don't know uh, that we're we're adding to you know to the budget every time. Why wouldn't we just wait for strategic plan and then we bring before you the concerns and recognize and work with city staff saying that they too recognize that we need to do it. If they didn't, uh, why wasn't it in the budget? You know, why wouldn't we have included it right away? And we have such a great initiative happening in our schools right now, very successful, and um, this this could be something something that could be added to their budget and, and worked in. So, I mean, far be it for me to say no. I, I, want, <laughs> I want school safety zones as much and uh, as all of us to e are equal that way. So I, 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 I want to support it, but I, it goes against how I believe we should be doing things. So I probably can't. Um, okay. Uh, Councilor McLaren, I'll, I'll let you just respond to, well, no, it's really more of a debate question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back to you in the next round and then you can address those questions. Okay. Next is Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, a question to staff. Um, I know that, that um, there's that new committee between staff and um, the school board and, and whatnot. And I just wondered, like at the more recent uh, committee meetings, um, is crossing guards, are crossing guards being discussed and a need for crossing guards? Commissioner Joyce. Thank you and through you. So the, the staff and the board, um, the committee, they look at the complete picture. So we're assessing the safety uh, surrounding the schools in a more holistic manner to arrive at what we feel is needed. Um, we, coming from that, if there's changes that we would seek from council, then we would come forward with council uh, if we need to make some budget amendments uh, going forward. The, the program right now, I would say, is, is working relatively effectively uh, with the school boards, uh, with concerns getting raised through the school board, then coming into the committee for the committee to discuss and to prioritize. So everything is on the table at those discussions, including crossing guards. Thank you. Just a follow-up question. Do you think uh, Director Semple will be bringing Council, like a report of some more recommendations sometime soon. Commissioner Joyce. Thank you and through you. Yes, uh, we do expect that, uh, particularly coming into the fall session and um, 
we're now just learning about some schools that may open. We're still trying to determine whether or not those uh, that school is going to open or not. Um, but there could be some recommendations coming forward as a result. Uh, okay, Councilor McLean. Thank you. So, yeah, I was on that committee, and um, it's now moved on to a panel. Um, part of the reason that uh, we're doing this now is because the school year starts in September, but budget is in is now. Um, so this is for the next school year. It's not for this school year, but it does start in 2023. If the money is not used, that's okay too. But this allows for the flexibility. Um, so just a quick question to staff: If by any chance the committee come, or sorry, the panel comes back and says that we do not need these. Um, what will go with the money? Will it go into a reserve somewhere? Commissioner Joyce? So, um, yes, it would, it would end up being a surplus uh, that would go back. Mm -hmm. So the point is to prepare for the future because school years do not coincide as well with our budget cycle. And this is a preparation for what I suspect will be an ask that uh, will be coming down the road. Um, if it doesn't turn out to be that way, no harm done. Okay, uh, anybody else on the amendment? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, carries 12 to one. Uh, Councillor Rich opposed. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Osterhoff, so 11 to two. Councillor Ridge and Osterhoff opposed. Okay, we are back to the budget as amended. Is there any further discussion? Uh, No, no, so we, we actually, so I just wanna make sure that there's no further amendments on the budget. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? Take the chair and recognize you. Okay. So can I just ask the, the city treasurer, based on the amendments that we've made, what is the property tax increase and what is the average increase to a homeowner as a result? And I'm sorry if I just put you on the spot to do that. Uh, no, you're not putting me on the spot. I have a really messy sheet of numbers here. I'm just trying to figure out which column I'm using here. Um, so we have, let me just walk through. So we have our 2.46, uh, including the 0.16. We have 0.18 um, for the... Um, fire and we have, and I'm sorry Mr. Mayor, I may have just missed that amendment. I'm assuming we're still talking $75,000. So we have another 0 0.03 for that. So we're probably at about 0 0.1, 0.2, about 3.2, uh, 3.25% at this point. I didn't include the 0.7 yet. So that's 3.25, not including the 0.7? Yes, so we're probably closer to about 3.3 with the 0.7. Okay. 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 Um, and what is that in terms of um, a dollar value on the average residential tax bill, approximately? So that would be approximately about $123 on an average. Okay. okay. I just want to make this point. A number of times tonight we've talked about, okay, well, this is only just another dollar or another $10, but it's cumulative, right? That's how you get to the number that you get to. So it's not splitting hairs. There's a principal piece here. So that's why I'm going to be a dissenting vote on this. That being said, I very much appreciate the debate and discussion around the table. I think it's really good, and I think it's important that councils seen what has probably been one of the most extensive budget deliberations that I've seen, uh, certainly in my time on council. This is a tough year, it's a tough budget, but I appreciate council's input on it. Thank you. Any other discussion? Oh, Deputy Mayor, could I have the chair back? <laughs> yeah, I return the chair. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Okay, any other discussion on the budget as amended? Uh, Councilor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I'll be very brief. This is my first budget, and I want to thank all of Council uh, for a very respectful, thorough, and really vibrant discussion. Th uh, this has been really great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And Councilor Rich. Through you, Your Worship, it may just be that I'm really tired. I got up at 4 a.m. with my son. Uh, I am, I'm just curious, as the, the vote as for the budget as amended, that includes the 0.7%, is that correct? Uh, so yes, if you look at the, the budget, so the, um, the acting clerk is gonna take us through a few different votes. Okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna vote on this in sections, but you will see that the third last paragraph includes that council approve an additional tax increase of 0.7% in 2023 to support ongoing homelessness services and supportive housing initiatives. Um, any councillor can separate that out if they want a separate vote or you can speak to it because the entire budget as amended is now on the floor. Okay, thank you, Your Worship, for the clarification. I appreciate it. Councillor Sun. Just uh, thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, just uh, quickly want to thank everyone uh, from the city staff, uh, from the public staff, from the uh, Kingstonians for their opinion to this budget. As uh, Councillor Toto said, this is our first budget. It was a learning point for us. We tried to learn as much as we could and try to participate as well effectively as much as we could. And uh, I want to send my uh, greatest thanks and my gratitude to all the city staff, the clerk office, all the commissioners and their staff for their team for putting all of this together for us and giving us the opportunity and help us to learn how to move forward. And uh, thank you, you and your uh, leadership as well. Okay, so with that, uh, Madam Acting Clerk, I'll ask if you will um, walk council through the, uh, the votes on the budget. Yes, if, if you can bear with me for about 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Mayor, we're just making some final amendments based on all of the amendments, just to make sure we're correct. Councilor Amos, we can start, though. You're going to leave the room for the first part, um, and I'll call you back when your, um, your conflict is over. Okay, so our first vote is going to be on the 2023 operating capital budgets um, for the uh, and sorry, this is for the all components of the operating capital budget that uh, relate to the seniors association for which Councillor Amos has declared a pecuniary interest. Okay, sorry, can you run that by me again, Madam Mountain Clerk? Yes, this is, these are the portions of the operating and capital budget that um, have to do with the Seniors Association. Right. They've been separated out in order to um, accommodate the uh, pecuniary interest declared by Councillor okay. Amos. Okay. Everyone's clear what we're voting on here? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, Councillor Amos, you can return. Councillor Osterhoff, you're excused for the next vote. Okay, the next vote is going to be for that portion of the uh, operating and capital budgets that deal with Kingston Access Service. Uh, they have been separated out in order to accommodate the pecuniary interest that has been declared by Councillor Osterhoff. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councillor Osterhoff, you can return. Okay, so the, the next three slides, and we'll give you about 10, 15 seconds to look at each one of them, deal with all of the rest of the operating and capital budgets, except for the uh, vote on the bylaw, which we'll do next. So the first slide, we've got the uh, capital portion, and then some administrative rec uh, direction. Okay, um, Madam Acting Clerk, can I just see the first slide again? Okay, so everyone sees that that will include the 0.7, then we have the amended budget, and then the remaining pieces as well. Okay. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by a vote of 12 to 1. Mayor Patterson opposed. Okay, and for our last vote, Councillor Osterhoff and Councillor Amos, you're excused once more.
And this last paragraph is directing staff to bring the necessary bylaws uh, to the March 21st, 2023 meeting of council. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Councilors, you can return. Councilor Amos, Councilor Osterhoff. They don't want. Okay, so we have now, we have now done all the votes on the budget. Uh, is there anything else to discuss tonight? Um, Councillor Rich. Thank you very much. I have a motion to put on the floor, please. I believe it's been sent to the clerk. Okay, um, so we have a a motion moved by Councillor Raid, seconded by Councillor Stephen. Whereas the Police Services Act sets out the respective roles, responsibilities, and authority of the Police Services Board in the city in establishing the budget for police services. Whereas the Police Services Board is required to submit budget estimates to Council in the form for the period and on a timetable determined by Council. Whereas following its review of the estimates, Council will establish an overall budget for the Board, it being understood that Council does not have the authority to approve or disprove specific items in the estimates. Whereas Council's authority to establish an overall budget but not approve or disapprove of specific budget items does not limit Council's ability to comment on specific proposed expenditures and cost reduction measures or express views in support of any measure to reduce costs. Whereas the Police Services Board has a statutory obligation to see that policing needs are met and the City has a legal duty to see that the necessary resources are made available. Therefore, it be resolved that City Council requests that the Kingston Police Services Board submit a quarterly financial report to Council accompanied by a briefing with a Q1 2023 operating budget report with variance explanations to come to Council by the end of Q2 2023. And the City Council requests that the 2024 Kingston Police Services budget be submitted in a form provided by the City's Chief Financial Officer to include more detailed information, provide greater public transparency, including budget requests by revenue and cost category with supporting details of variances to the prior year budget, trends of prior year budgets and actuals, current year estimated surplus, budget challenges, reduction strategies and efficiencies, highlights of current year work plans and priorities and related budget implications, and highlights of future year priorities and projected budget increases. Now, our procedural rule, because this was not on the agenda, it requires a two-thirds vote to add this for discussion tonight. So that's the first thing that I will do. Uh, so, so first a vote on whether or not to add this to the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed? That's good. Oh, I thought we had a mover in a seconder. Yes, thank you, Madam Attaker. So I need a motion, a mover and a seconder to add the motion moved by Councillor Reg and Councillor Stevens. So moved by Councillor Amos, second by Councillor Toso. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Now the motion moved by Councillor Ridge and Councillor Steven is now on the floor and open for discussion. Councillor Ridge, you have the floor. Thank you, everyone, uh, uh, through your worship. Uh, thank you, everybody, and I know it's been a very long evening, so I'll try my best to keep this brief, uh, far more brief than the motion itself is. So uh, this motion is all about uh, transparency and accountability. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, in my other job, uh, part of what I do is I manage federal research funds and uh, they total approximately $64 million and that's doled out over seven years. And part of the requirements for that, those funds are detailed quarterly reports to the governing body, uh, both to the board of management, but also to the federal government as well, the ministry. Um, and I mention this because that is a general basic accountability piece that we see in many operations where it's public funding. And um, part of my concerns that I saw with the budget documents from public agencies was the lack of detail that currently exists both in the report for the 2022 uh, actuals or projected actuals for, from the Police Services Board. And additionally, uh, the budget request or proposal as it was put forward for 2023. Um, so just with that being said, uh, I'm just, what I was looking for uh, is put in detail in that motion with regards to stronger financial reporting, stronger accountability processes so that we as council can see how this, uh, how these expenses are moving forward from this specific uh, services board. And part of the reason that I'm put forward this motion is because it is one of the largest expenses in our budget. This is, I think, 
uh, part of due diligence as a member of a governing body to ensure that there is this level of transparency in reporting so that we can make informed decisions moving forward and so that we can ask the right questions. Um, and as it currently exists I, in, in my other role, I would say that that would not satisfy these requirements. So this is a step in the right direction and I hope that you will support the motion and yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Councilman McLaren. Thank you, I like this very much. And um, there's a question, since um, you're asking the CFO to provide a form for them to fill out, I'm wondering if you recall a conversation we had about six years ago about the eight different strategies on how to reduce budget. Um, among them were things like um, defer spending, um, delay spending, cancel spending, like they've canceled the horse, so I mean, it's possible. Um, could that be part of that form that you give them? Ms. Kennedy? Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, I think we've got some standard forms now that we use for the reporting, so I think this is just a matter of, of the best way to kind of slice and dice the data to bring it back to council as opposed to some of these other strategies. Those are strategies that we do that I do discuss quite often with the police in terms of at budget time, um, but I think this will be more about just bringing that the actual data forward to council. Thank you, and um, to the members on the board, um, would it be possible to ask you guys to return a lower budget, such as perhaps um, asking whether the uh, armored truck is really necessary or whether there's full cost recovery on um, criminal record checks or things like that. Um, rent, for example, they rent out a portion of their, um, of their um, headquarters to a private company. Um, if we can maximize those. And, um, but I guess the real one is, the biggest one is the board chooses, or more precisely, um, determines what, it, what counts as Act as effective and as uh, adequate policing, um, considering that we're moving a lot of stuff towards others, to other agencies, uh, might it be possible to lower those standards and thereby save money? So, so Councilor McLaren, so I'll just say, I'll say one thing as chair and then one thing is the vice, one thing as the chair of this meeting and one thing is the vice chair on the police services board. So first, as chair of this meeting, the motion before us is really more about transparency, be accountability, and reporting. So the motion is not necessarily asking for a reduction in the budget. We've already approved a budget, in this case, a budget increase of 4%. What I can say, as mayor and as vice chair of the Police Services Board, that I will be very clear with the board and with police that they must live within this budget, that another deficit is not acceptable to council. I think we've heard that very clearly in our budget meetings, and I will make sure that that message is obviously conveyed very strongly. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the police board has a duty to see that policing needs of the community are met, and the city in turn has a duty to make sure that the necessary funds are provided. As council, our role in this relationship is to ensure that there's an appropriate spending of public funds. And we're here to make sure that any agency or department using public money is using it responsibly and appropriately. So on Monday night, various partner agencies and boards presented their 2023 budgets to council. And for the majority of these organizations, the requested funds ranged from about one and a half million up to about six and a half million or so. And that's a lot of money. And if it were allowed, I can only assume that these organizations could and would spend more, but that's not how it works. Um, there's only so much money to go around as you know, we heard in our discussions tonight. That's why budgets are created, right? So organizations and departments know their spending limits. The Kingston Police Services Board asked our council to approve a net operating budget of over $44 million for 2023. 1.5 million is a lot of money, 44 million is considerably more. Budgets submitted here to council really should be detailed because that's how we ensure transparency and that's our job. This year's police budget was vague at best and as representatives for taxpayers here in the city of Kingston, we should be told how these millions and millions of dollars have been spent. Furthermore, 
we expect a reasonable budget with sufficient detail to be presented to us for any future spending. I felt uncomfortable approving this budget as it stands. It's too vague. Um, and from the remarks the other night, I'm not sure that the budget exercise was taken very seriously, or if it was, we didn't get to see the results of that in what we were given. Um, that said, I'm not sure how much good it would have done to send it back. So this is why Councillor Ridge and I are bringing this motion forward tonight. We, as I believe you do too, expect accountability and transparency, because without transparency, we undermine the public trust. We were elected to represent the public interest, and that most certainly includes financial accountability. So I encourage you to vote for this motion. Quarterly financial reports with a briefing so that we can actually ask questions since the budget document didn't tell us how the money was and will be spent. And we think it's entirely appropriate and indeed necessary that we actually keep an eye on where these funds are going. So in addition to the quarterly check-ins, as was already mentioned, we expect a, a more professional, please, detailed budget to come to council for 2024. And I sincerely hope this is the only time we ever have to bring a motion like this. And to be clear, this is not meant as an attack. This is about transparency and accountability, and it would apply to any agency or department. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to support this, but I think maybe we need to cut to the chase here. Although there was vagary in the budget, there was actually an absolute lack of accounting for a reoccurring exp expense, and we all know what that expense was. That's the expense to police street parties. And it's the elephant in the room that we often don't like to discuss. And this isn't about blaming, it's not about throwing dispersions, but if we don't put this sort of information out in the public view and we don't put it out around this table, we can't come up with solutions. So that's what concerned me more than the other parts of the budget. Um, I was tempted not to vote um, in favor of the police budget because of this lack. Um, to me, it did not represent the true cost of things. Now we've taken from reserve funds again to um, cover the expense to this city, but that expense to this city then leaves us short in terms of the other things we wanna do, like firefighters. Um, so that's why all of this has to come forward. Um, so I'm in favor of this. I want a true and full accounting. Um, we were all elected to represent our constituents and mine want to know. Um, they want it laid out, what we're spending on this, um, so that then their voices are going to be heard about how we move forward in terms of, of managing the situation. Uh, so. I don't think it was nearly as vague as we think it was. I think that this is something that is a difficult conversation, and I think there are some people who may not have wanted to have that conversation. So I'm hopeful that we're gonna have honest conversations. And um, that's where I've been all evening on all of this, that I want the facts, I want the full information, because you're asking us to make big decisions, so please get that out to us. We're not your enemy in any of this, but if we don't have all of the information, we cannot make the good decisions that are expected of us. So I'll vote for it. Uh, Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Um, I'm gonna echo all, basically what all of you have just said, and I'll try and be brief. I had asked a couple of questions uh, to the interim chief, and I didn't feel my, I, I didn't feel I received any answers to my questions. My frustration level was very, very high at the end of that conversation. The budget was rolled up so tight that there was no transparency. You, can't, you couldn't tell. I asked an innocent question in regards to um, the services line and I, I received some fluffy answers and it, it, it was 3.5 million. That's a lot of money. And there was no real direct answers given to me. Um, the $750,000 that was asked for vehicles, how many vehicles, what was it about? Um, give us a breakdown. There was no breakdown on any aspect of that. In the world I come from, um, I'm audited every year. I have to open my books up and I felt that um, what was being presented to me was, this is our books, you don't need to see our books, you need to trust us that we're doing the right job. 
we need to do our job, and that's that accountability uh, phase. And so with Councillor's Ridge proposal, I think this is the right step in that direction of accountability so that we are doing the right aspect at our end. Our police services are doing their job, but we need to do ours, and we need to see the books. Um, we need to hold each other accountable, and this is that aspect, so I'll be supporting this. Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you once again. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ridge and uh, Councillor Stephen for bringing this motion. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a great initiative uh, moving forward to the accountability, not only the police service board, but we need to look into all the boards and the um, our partners in the organization who we work with to see their accountability. I observe whole budget presentations and I have been talking to a few people as well. I did, if I recall, I don't remember then, if I see anything, any organization presented with the previous budget, what they have gained. They ask for more, they tell us why they're increasing the budget, why they need more money, but I haven't seen the accomplishment. I haven't seen, they, they highlight their accomplishment of what they have brought back to the city. So it's not only the police, we would need to look at it, but it is, I think, first step to moving forward to set up the accountability for all the uh, organizations and uh, boards and uh, stuff like that. Um, I will answer the uh, Councillor Amos' comments about the police, uh, acting police chief. As he mentioned his comments, that he did not prepare this budget. That was not his budget, he's just presenting on it. So I'll give just him credit not to discredit him because he couldn't answer, but he didn't have study enough. He should study enough. But also, um, I'm going to support this uh, motion. It's very important, but I urge all of you to remember, it's not only the police budget. We have to make accountable all the uh, organization and, and, and the departments that we, we see how they're spending money and what is the result behind. I like to see personally the result-driven movements and, and the fundings. We, we're not gonna just increase the budget every year, but we want to see what we have accomplished. Where are we standing uh, as of today versus the last year and where are we moving forward? What, what is the goal to move moving forward? What are we gonna achieve the next year? I, and I think that that's the right accountability. Thank you, Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, with this motion, um, it brings the police back in front of us by the end of June. And all years before, we've only seen the police once, and that's at budget time. So the best part of this motion, in my opinion, is that it brings the police back now twice this year, and we can ask more questions. It would be at the start of a council meeting when we're all fresh, not at 9.45 at night. And we can ask lots and lots of questions, really thorough. Also, because they'll be here at the end of June, we'll know the results of um, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, because we heard the police chief say they're going to try a new strategy. We're going to then know what that expense comes out and um, how successful the new strategy is, and that will be able to ask more questions about how they'll prepare for homecoming in October. So I support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I welcome this motion, and I think that it is warranted given the presentation that we saw on a few days ago, and given um, the information that we were provided. Um, one thing that struck me watching presentations for the first time as a first time counselor is just how lacking it was in detail on very essential aspects of it that we got a more thorough budget from Kingston Access Bus, which is a much smaller portion of it, and we can adjust and amend that. I found that a little unusual. Let's be very clear, and I think what this council has shown tonight, is we stand with frontline responders. We, st we stand with people who are on the front lines serving the public. I stand with them. Uh, this is not a, a motion against, those p against police officers. This is a motion to say we have a public trust to look at where money is going. We, ask, we just had a long debate over the value of uh, putting more firefighters out over, you know, eight, eight over 12, over four. That, that's a healthy discussion. That's a democratic discussion. 
we have not been able to have that about the value that we have of police services. We aren't, we are told in our documentation that we are not a rubber stamp. We can provide suggestions. This motion is providing a suggestion. If you want to have a 40 something million dollar budget, you need to provide us with the details of that. We are fulfilling our elected duties. We are, everyone around this table has been elected and we represent the public. We are fulfilling that, and that is what we are doing. Police offer a valuable and essential service. There is no debate on that. But every other public service, we have a debate on the value for service, the value of the money that we get out of it, as we should. We are taxing people to provide a service for them, and they have to know that they are getting good value from us. Otherwise, in three years, four years, they will not, if we don't fulfill that duty, send us back to the horseshoe table. Transparency is not a bad thing. Transparency adds additions to the public trust. Sunshine helps things grow. I support this motion. Okay, is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Okay, we will call the vote on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Okay, is there anything else? No communications. <laughs> so this time I'm not going to ask for a motion to recess. I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Amos. All those in favor? Opposed? And we are adjourned. Thanks very much, everybody. Yeah.